Good afternoon, welcome. We're going to come to order now. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, February the 10th convening of the Baltimore City Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. Sorry for uh, a little bit of a late start here. Um, some uh, uh, house rules before we go forward. Uh, first, if you have a cell phone, a pager, uh, anything else that makes any kind of audible electronic sound, anything that rings, chirps, beeps, plays a ringtone, um, we ask at a minimum that you please turn that to a vibrate only if not off position. Uh, similarly, if you uh, need to have a conversation uh, with someone in the gallery, we can please ask you to take that out the double doors to your rear. And the reasons for those rules are pretty simple. Uh, you'll note that there are a number of microphones arrayed around us up here, and those microphones are all very sensitive, but not only for the purpose of amplification, but also for the purpose of recording these proceedings and cell phones, pagers, conversations, and the like interrupt with that recording process. Additionally, they're um, just generally disruptive to the proceedings. Uh, also, uh, you'll note um, behind us up here, there are two video cameras mounted on the walls, and those of you who are forward of the wall there, if you turn around, you'll see that there are one, two, three cameras on the uh, wall behind you. These proceedings are being recorded uh, for broadcast on the city's cable access channel. That's right after Wayne's World. Um, and uh, uh, cell phones, pagers, conversations, and the like generally disrupt that process as well. Um, we will be uh, voting at the end of today's docket, uh, and you're certainly more than welcome to hang around and enjoy a civics lesson. But if you've got other plans for this splendid February afternoon, that's understandable. And you can also call into the zoning board office in the morning, find out uh, how we ruled, and that way you won't have to wait around all day. Take out pen and paper. I can give you uh, the number for the zoning board office, and I'll read this number off a couple of times. Number for the zoning board office is 410-396-4301. That's 410-396-4301. You will, however, need to wait until you receive the formal written outcome of your case. That should be forthcoming in about three to four weeks. Um, we certainly ask that you not build in the city of Baltimore without first obtaining proper permits. Uh, <clears throat> next, if you have not uh, already done so, if you're here in opposition to any case, we ask that you please sign in on our signing sheet. Being held up by Mr. Uh, French right now. Um, the signing sheet allows us to know uh, not only which cases generally have opposition, but also allows us uh, to know who needs to receive those aforementioned written notices to which I just referred. Um, uh, and so if we don't know who you are, more importantly, how to contact you, we won't know um, how to let you know when your case is going forward in case it gets postponed today. Um, and there, we do have a few postponements, which I'll go over in just a minute. Uh, and also, we need to know uh, who and where you are so that we can send you the written outcome of your case. 
Uh, the procedure, uh, if you're the appellant when your case is called, you will come and stand to my left or your right. Um, please don't be afraid of the microphones. I promise that they don't bite, although some of the board members may. Um, <clears throat> the appellant will come to uh, my left or your right. Opposition will come to my right or your left. Um, once everyone is up here, we'll get you sworn in. Uh, we'll first uh, turn to the appellant who will be given the opportunity to tell us what it is um, uh, that they would uh, like to do, uh, what uh, are the issues involved in, uh, uh, in their case, and respond to any issues um, or questions that are brought up by the board. Also present uh, testimony from any witnesses that they'd uh, like to present. Once they're done uh, with their side of things, then we'll turn to the opposition who'll be given uh, an opportunity to present their case. Uh, and once the opposition is concluded, we'll return back to the appellant who will respond to any points brought up by the opposition uh, as well as offer a closing statement. We won't be going back and forth and back and forth, unnecessarily drawing things out and keeping folks here longer than they need to be. Um, we will generally be calling the cases in the order in which they appear on the docket, with some exceptions. Um, first, uh, there are some matters that have been postponed for today. These cases will not be heard. 2014-557, um, 1625 Tame Street, that case has been postponed. 2014-572, uh, 5550 Newberry Street, uh, that case has been postponed until March 24th at 5 p.m. I note that someone has signed in in opposition on that, so please, uh, if there's anyone else who's signed in or who's interested in that case, please make sure that you're signed in so that we know to um, uh, send you the notice of the uh, new hearing date. But that case will not be heard today. Um, also, 2014-592, 5101 Endart Avenue, known as 12... Well, known as 1927 Ben Hill Avenue. That case has been postponed. Uh, so if you are here on either of those cases, uh, if you haven't already done so, please sign in on the sign-in sheet so that uh, we can send you the notices uh, for when those cases will be going forward, but they will not be going forward today. Next are the cases that are on our consent agenda, and the consent agenda consists of cases which the Zoning Board staff uh, has previously reviewed the files and determined there's sufficient information to approve these appeals. Uh, we'll call all of the consent cases as a group, uh, so uh, try to stay in the order in which you're called. First person will line up here, and the next person will line up uh, behind them, and we'll just make a line um, down the dais there. Um, once everyone's here, we'll get you sworn in, and then you'll be given the opportunity, as each case is called, to offer any, um, uh, uh, any supplements you'd like to have added to the record. First case is 2014-548, 1203 Durst Street, Charles George. Next case is 2014-578, 220 South Chapel Street, Paul and Denise Attics. Next case is 2014-579, 1906 Soulgrave Avenue, Carol Anderson Ostra. <coughs> Next is 2014-581, 1400 through 12, uh, Greenmount Avenue, STV Incorporated, care of Susan Williams. Next is 2014-584, 2123 Moyer Street, Gina Campbell. Next is 2014-587, 1133 Hubbard Street, Julie Tice. Next 2014-591, 837 Park Avenue, James and Margaret Cox. Next 2015-2, 13 East Randall Street, Anna Leventis. 2015-3, 2700 Fate Avenue, AB Associates, care of Nate Preddle. Next, 2014-4, 2015 2015-4, 5 West 24th Street, Jason Pearson, well, Pierin. And finally, 2015-6, 2100 Ashland Avenue, 
Andrew Frank. Okay, can you all raise your hands and be sworn, please? Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, first case up is 2014 548, 1203 Durst Street, Charles George. Afternoon, Mr. George. Uh, we have this as an application to construct a second floor rear addition with uh, new. Uh, third floor with rooftop deck, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. French, anything for the planning department? Martin French for the Baltimore City Planning Department. Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. George, was there anything you'd like to have added to the record at this time? Okay. The Zoning Board staff, having previously reviewed these files, we found that there was sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Next case, 2014 578, 220 South Chapel Street, Paul and Denise Attucks. Afternoon. Uh, we have this as an application to construct a two story rear addition. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. French, anything for the planning department? Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Attucks, uh, anything further you'd like to have added to the record at this time? All right. The zoning board staff, having previously reviewed the application, we've determined that there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. Next, 2014 579, 1906 Soulgrave Avenue, Carol Anderson Ostra. Right. Uh, we have this as an application to construct a two level rear deck with pergola and lattice screening. Is that that's, correct? That's yes. correct. Okay. Mr. French, anything for the planning department? Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. And anything uh, you'd like to have added to the record at this no. time? Is there anything you need for um, the reason for the design re was really responding to the slopes? And I know that was an issue. Okay. Did you, um, did you want to submit that? Sure. All right. right. I have a site uh, plan also that really explains the um, elevations, and that was the problem. All right. And your name, sir? Paul. Uh, Okay. Uh, and I was asked to certify when the sign was put up. Did you go back to the Yeah, no? yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. our standard yeah. form that we use to certify the posting. And the uh, spelling we have on that last name is D A G D I G I A N. Correct. Okay. We will have these added to the record. Anything further? Okay. okay. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed the application, we determined there's sufficient information to approve the appeal. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you both. Next, 2014 581, 1400 through 1412 Greenmount Avenue, STV Incorporated, care of Susan Williams. Yes, sir. Afternoon, Ms. Williams. We have this as an application to construct, well, to consolidate lots, renovate the structure as artist studios slash maker spaces. Cafe carry out with outdoor table service, accessory to the cafe, and recreation and community center with classrooms uh, with ID signs, including exterior graphics and 23 off street parking spaces. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. French? Thank you. This property is located in the Greenmount West Open Renewal Plan area. This property site plan is being approved by the Site Plan Review Committee January 7th, 2013. The department therefore recommends approval of this appeal subject to the conditions that all improvements be consistent with the standards and requirements of the Green Out West Urban Renewal Plan and with the site plan approved by the site plan review committee. Stated by the planning department, a minimal to you? Yes. Okay. Was there anything you'd like to have added um, to the record? Yes. Um, we've been working with the North, the new Green Mount West Community Association. You have this letter in your file which we got an email of. This one has the actual signature. Um, okay. I wanted to make sure you got a letter from the Baltimore Development Corporation in support and also documentation showing we have consolidated the property. Okay. We also have a representative of the community and the, the uh, open works here if you have any questions. Uh, okay. Um, was there anything that you'd like to add, ma'am? No, on, on behalf of the Green Mount West Community um, Association, we're very excited about this project. My name is Lindsay Esposito, L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-E-S-P-O-S-I-T-O. <laughs> Thank you. Anything further, Ms. Williams? No, sir. 
Okay. The Zoning Board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we determined there's sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck. Much. Next up, 2014 584, 2123 Moyer Street. Ginny Campbell? Yeah, I'm in his name. My okay. name is Idan, it's I D A N. Last name is T Z A M E R E T. T Z A M A M E R E T. E R E T. Just call me Idan. Then you have to pronounce it. Okay, <laughs> just I was going to say. How do you pronounce the last name? Zameret. Zameret, okay? Okay, yeah, <laughs> I try. Okay, Mr. Zameret. Uh, we have this as an application to construct a second floor overhanging rear addition with rooftop deck. Is that correct? Yep. All right. Mr. French, anything for the planning department? The planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Zamaret, uh, anything you'd like to have added to the record at this time? No. Okay. The zoning board staff, having previously reviewed the application, we determined there's sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Good Thank luck. You. Next up, 2014 587. 1133 Howard Street, a much easier name, Julie Tice. I have. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Tice. We've, had, we've got this as an application to construct a two-story rear addition with second floor rear deck and rooftop deck. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And Mr. French, anything for the planning department? Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. And Ms. Tice, anything you'd like to have added to the record? No, thank you. All right. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed your application, we determined there was sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. Next, 2014 591 uh, 837 Park Avenue, James and Margaret Cox. Yeah, thank you. All right. And Mr. Cox, we have this as an application to use the premises to house two dwelling units in the property. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And Mr. French, anything for the planning department? Planning Department notes this property is in both the Mount Vernon Urban Renewal Plan area and the Mount Vernon Historic District. And with regard to the latter, any exterior changes that may be necessitated to the property as a result of approval of this application would have to receive a notice to proceed from the City's Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. The Department of Planning recommends that approval of this appeal be subject to the condition that any exterior additions, alterations, or demolition related to the Board's approval of an additional dwelling unit are consistent with the notice to proceed issued by the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Cox, uh, are the conditions stated by the Planning Department amenable to you? They are. All right. And was there anything you'd like to have added to the record this time? No, thank you. All right. Zoning Board staff, having previously reviewed application, we determined there's sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank Thanks. You. Good luck. Next, 2015 2, 13 East Randall Street, Anna Laventis. Hi. Uh, Ms. Laventis, we have this as an application to use the first floor as a tavern with kitchen use. Is that correct? Okay. And Mr. French, anything for the Planning Department? Planning Department recommends approval of this application. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Laventis, was there anything you'd like to have added to the record at this time? We have. Okay. We already have. All right. <coughs> anything else? All right. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed the application, we determined there is sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, 2015-3, 2700 Fate Avenue, uh, AB Associates, care of Mr. Prettle. <coughs> Afternoon, Mr. Prettle. Yes, we have this an application to use the first floor as non-resident physician's office. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And Mr. French, anything for the planning department? The planning department recommends approval of this application. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brettle, anything further I'd like to have added to the uh, Just like to introduce stuff. Dr. Randy Holden. Afternoon, and doctor. And also, you should have a letter of support from the Canyon Community Association. We do. Okay. okay. Anything further? All right. Zoning board staff having previously made a video application, we determined there's sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank Thanks. You. Good luck. Next is 2015 5 West 24th Street, Jason Pyron. Am I pronouncing that name? Pyron. Pyron. Oh, good job. Uh, Mr. Pyron, we have this as an application to retain formerly detached one-story rear bicycle garage as an attached bicycle garage. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Mr. French, anything for the planning department? Planning department recommends approval of this application. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Pyron, anything further you'd like to have added to the record this time? I provide copies of uh, letters of support. 
Thank you. Um, the first one is uh, from my direct name. I think we have all of them. Thank you. Are we? Also, one other one emailed that I posted this afternoon from the president, which I was going to be. Is that this one? Can we get that? Uh, no. Uh, uh, Matthew Herman. I don't know who put that. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was emailed to Mr. Kennedy. Uh, we, we have that in the file? Okay, great. We have all that. Um, and we have these letters, David? Yeah. Okay. You uh, anything further, Mr. Parman? Yes. Okay. Zoning board staff, having previously reviewed the application, we can give sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. All right. <coughs> this next one, I'm going to recuse myself and pass it over. Okay. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> next up is 2015-6, 2100 Ashland Avenue, uh, care of Andrew Frank. Would you be Mr. Frank? I am. Good afternoon. This is an application to install five foot high by 92 foot long illuminated letters rooftop sign onto a newly constructed school. Is that correct? Yes. Mr. French, any comment from Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Is there anything that you would like to uh, supplement the record with today? For the record, the school hosted a community and parents meeting on January 13th. We acquired every property around the school, including the church, and um, the parents' group should have submitted a letter in support. No correspondence. Is there a copy that you want? To? I guess you can forward it later. Okay. You should be getting it, yeah. We'll make sure it gets in there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anything further? No. Board staff. Right. The staff has already <laughs> uh, reviewed your application and has determined that there is sufficient information in the record to approve your appeal. Okay, that concludes our consent docket. <coughs> and the next group of cases which we will turn to uh, include cases where uh, opposition is signed in. Frequently we found that opposition is the result of either a lack of communication or miscommunication between the parties. And it can be useful to offer the parties an opportunity to have a dialogue between themselves, see if they can't uh, resolve their differences. Obviously if uh, 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 two sides approach the board um, and ask the board to resolve a uh, dispute, someone's bound to walk away from that uh, process disappointed. Uh, and this is your opportunity to avoid that unhappy fate. Um, I'll read off the cases where opposition is signed in, uh, and as I call your case, you can just stay where you are, and I'll just ask you to stand. Um, we'll offer you an opportunity to have a dialogue. We'll see if you, the sides have spoken previously or not. Uh, if you would like to ha have a dialogue, that's um, perfectly fine, and we encourage that. Just step out the double doors to your rear, and if you get something worked out, or even if you don't, um, just uh, when you're um, done your discussion, just uh, come back inside and we'll call you in turn. Um, if you do get a agreement accomplished, uh, when your uh, turn is called, we'll um, get you up here and put it on the record. Uh, first case where opposition is signed in is 2014-358, 47, 11 and a half through 15 Harford Road, Jab and Spence. Uh, okay, have uh, you folks had an opportunity to have a discussion? You have? Um, opp any opportunity for further dialogue be productive? No? Okay. All right. Um, have a seat and we'll get to you in just a moment. Uh, next case is the opposition is postponed. Next, 2014 585, 201 through 31 South Conklin Street, Caroline Hecker. I guess they must be in the hallway. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Council. Um, next, 2014-590, 203 East North Avenue, Jose Taveras. Yes. Okay. And who signed in opposition on that? Okay. Have you folks had an opportunity to have a dialogue? Okay. Just let us know when you're ready to go forward. And 2014-595, 1800 and 1810 South Hanover Street, AB Associates, care of Nate Prettle. I recall this one from before. I think you've spoken in the past. Any prospects for a resolution this time? Uh, 
Um, sure. Actually, if they can, the signing sheet isn't just for opposition. I'll have, I'll have it signed. Okay, sure, sure. Um, and um, we can try to juggle things as much as we can to see if we can't get you a little bit quicker. But okay, all right, all right. First case uh, is 2014-358, 47, 11 and a half through 15 Harford Road, Javin Spence. This is an application to use the portion known as 301, well, 3001 Rose Kemp Avenue as a garage other than accessory for the storage, repair, and servicing of motor vehicles, including state inspection, not over one and a half ton capacity, not including bodywork, painting, or engine rebuilding. Is that correct? Yes. The address is incorrect. It's, uh, the address is 47.13. Okay, first of all, ma'am, what's your name? And what was that address again? It's 4713 Harcourt Road. I saw the, um, I was asked to um, where the site came. Okay. And Mr. Tanner, is that what you were going to refer to? Yeah, the Rose Camp address is on the same lot, but it's a separate structure. This structure is in the rear of the lot that I highlighted on that drawing. Okay. It's basically a garage. One story structure. Okay. All right. <clears throat> if you all can raise your hands and be sworn, please. I do swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. All right. Do we have staff reports? Yes. First, we have some letters from the Walkerson Improvement Association, the Morgan Park Improvement Association, Arbel and Baltimore Development Corporation. In addition to their opposition, they also write that the property does not conform to the current zoning and the Laurelville Urban Renewal Plan, which covers this location and prohibits the proposed uses. Furthermore, the Laurelville Urban Renewal Plan also mandates that uses within the boundaries be reviewed by the Community Review Panel. Uh, and we are concerned over the fact that the panel has not had an opportunity to meet with the appellants. Well, since that time, the panel has met, and the panel, ha panel has written, the Harford Road Community Review Panel, within the confines of the Urban Renewal Ordinance for the Laurelville Business District, the Community Review Panel has reviewed, discussed, and met with the appellant. We see no grounds for objection. Moreover, the panel agrees with and supports the recommendations made by the planning department in their memorandum. That leads us to the planning department's recommendation. Nice to have an intro for once. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> planning department notes this property is in the Laurelville, Laurelville business area or renewal plan area. And there are very specific uses which are prohibited by that plan and that uh, is summarized in a memorandum which was made available to this board. <clears throat> On the basis of that list of prohibited uses, the department is recommending that approval of this appeal, if granted, be subject to these conditions in addition to any conditions the board may establish. One, the repair and servicing of motor vehicles will be limited to body repair and engine rebuilding, and there will be no automobile painting, automobile accessory sales, repair or installation, automobile glass and mirror sales and service, or similar commercial activity on the property. Two, that there will be no parking, staging, or storing of vehicles on public rights of way. Three, that there will be no parking or storage of unlicensed vehicles on the property. Four, that all work will be for performed indoors. Five, that all materials, parts, and equipment related to the use will be stored indoors. Six, that the area used for temporary storing of vehicles at the rear of the property will be adequately screened by an opaque fence or wall meeting the requirements of the Lauraville Business Area Urban Renewal Plan. And seventh, if a dumpster is used to collect waste and trash related to the use, 
The dumpster will be placed either inside the existing building or within a masonry enclosure having a solid lockable wooden gate. Thank you. Are the conditions stated by the planning department fine with you? Yes. Okay, so you accept those? Yes. Okay. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you are um, proposing here? I'm just trying to start a business that's doing 80% um, Maryland State Inspection, dealing with dealerships, and just minor auto repair. I'm not doing no body work, no painting, no selling of accessories or anything like that. And all the work will be done inside. I've been there for like three years doing uh, wholesale with uh, automobiles, and uh, I have, n have n never had a problem with the community until now okay. when I'm trying to expand. Just, just one at a time. One at a time. And, and just, I mean, uh, that's basically it. I'm just trying to expand my business. Okay. Um, Ms. B, if you can come up to the microphone now. Just be careful of the mic that's right there. Um, you were going to say? I just was going to say that Mr. Spence has been um, a tenant for, um, he's now entered his fourth year, and um, he truly has been an exemplary um, tenant, and none of the neighbors have complained. Um, in fact, the local businesses, Truex, which is also one of our, there's like a total of eight properties in that little area and no one objects to the work that's being done there because he keeps the area very clean okay um and i do have pictures of the building if you'd like to see that actually might be very useful okay so um i think we might have those pictures but they're in black and white and they yeah. don't really come out well yeah. Well, um, here's the site plan that we did because I know that there was some question about the joining wall because there's two LLCs right mm -hmm. next to each other. Um, we've actually had quite a few uh, concerns with the LLC next door because of delinquent water bills and other things that keep coming on our, ad you know, we keep getting them on our address when it's clearly not ours. And But I think we finally got that straightened out. Um, but if you look here, that's a visual, but I think these pictures, um, this is the front of Harford Road right here. Mm -hmm. So we own um, this to here. This is, um, this is the house, 3001 Rose Kemp. Mm -hmm. This is the gated area that Javon does keep cars that he's working on, but there's absolutely nothing but cars in his gated area, is and it's on our property. Is that portion that's right here in the area? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, um, let's see, it's, here's, the, here's a good picture of the warehouse. So it's very, it lends itself very well to that kind of work. It's, it's a warehouse. My dad, yeah had it as a plumbing company. He actually built it back in the 70s. Okay. Okay. And did you guys need to see any of these photos? I'm gonna imagine that you're familiar enough with it though. Okay. Okay, anything further? All right. Do you want these to become a part of the record? No, I can make a copy and mail it to you. That's fine. <laughs> but you do have this, correct? This yes. is the yes, site plan. Yes, we've got okay. that. We'll keep that, as well as the revised drawing. Um, I'll turn to your opposition now. Um, do you guys have copies of the submitted um, site plan? Again, I'm imagining that I'm you're sorry, probably. I'm sorry, Julius. Here, I don't think Mr. Kirk's. Okay. Here, here's um. Here's actually. We're not disputing ownership of the property, which was a question in the last hearing. Um, okay, so you can just state your name for the record, please. I'm Mike Hilliard. I'm the Community Services Director and the New York Executive Director of the Cardinal Community Organization. Um, Moravia Walter Improvement Association, which is the affected community 
under President Bob Kirk is here today, um, still opposes this use. Um, I would note that um, respectfully disagree with Planning's interpretation of the urban renewal plan. Um, in my tenure, tenure at Hartel, this is the first time um, <clears throat> the urban renewal plan has ever been interpreted to permit automotive uses except those that were grandfathered in prior to the implementation of the plan. Um, but Moravia Walter has other, other issues which Mr. Kirk will um, be happy to express. Okay. Come forward, Mr. Kirk. Yes. Hi, again, my name is Bob Kirk, and I'm president of Moravia, of Moravia Walter Community Association. Um, we understand um, and um, respectfully disagree with planning's uh, decision as well uh, granting this because we were under the impression that um, according to the URP that it would not happen and we have said that um, I must add that during the last CRP meeting uh, I was unable to um, attend due to an emergency uh, and was not able to express uh, our community associations uh, views that we disagree and will uh, attempt to follow up uh, with that to at least express uh, our viewpoint. Um, we understand uh, planning has already granted approval of this and, uh, and we just wanted to express uh, um, my community association, which is directly involved uh, in Rose Kemp. Uh, we're a community association that encompasses about 225 houses directly involved in that. Um, also, if um, in your voting that um, you agree uh, to grant this uh, proposal, uh, we respectfully ask that you um, go with the um, seven conditions that uh, the planning document uh, dated 12, December 11th indicate about vehicles and so forth. Um, um, Myself uh, and as another business representative walked over there yesterday and uh, we respectfully again indicate that uh, we strongly feel that number three of the conditions of uh, no parking storage of unlicensed vehicles on the property. Uh, there's currently five vehicles untagged uh, on the property that are visually there uh, at the moment. Um, one of them uh, had several flat tires there and there is a prop there is a property 3103 I believe directly within 25 feet of this business where the residents start on Rose Camp uh, and uh, we therefore oppose uh, you know uh, ask that these conditions be implemented and we'd be giving given a mechanism that when uh, we as a community association see that there are not that we have somewhere to go with this uh, again uh, understanding that this may be approved because planning has, and we, again, respectfully oppose this. Thank okay. you. Um, Mr. French, um, if the claim has been made that there's been some change in planning's interpretation of the um, applicable URP, um, if you can address planning's view of the issue. All right, thank you. The Urban Renewal Plan contains a list of prohibited uses in uh, <clears throat> one of its sections concerning the uses that are permitted and the uses that are prohibited. It does not specifically mention the zoning code category garages other than, other than accessory for storage, repair, and servicing of motor vehicles not over one and a half tons capacity, including body repair, painting, and engine rebuilding. Because it does not specifically mention that use, the plan does not restrict that use directly. However, indirectly, it does limit that use because the plan has specific prohibitions, which were incorporated in the recommended conditions, prohibiting automobile accessory stores, including related repair or installation service. It prohibits automobile glass and mirror shops. It prohibits automobile painting shops. And therefore, basically, what the planning department is doing is separating out from the larger category that's in the zoning code the portions of that category that could not be approved under the urban renewal plan 
And on that basis, we're recommending the specific restrictions that I've stated previously. Um, and uh, if I understand the process, uh, with respect to this appeal, there was a presentation before the community review panel. Um, and then the panel said that they, it's kind of ambiguously worded, we see no grounds for objection. Um, and then they say that they agree and support the recommendations made by the planning department. Um, Mr. Stoser's uh, um, memo, is that the same That's one that the memo that from? they're referring to, I believe, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, anything further? Okay. <clears throat> um, Mr. Spence or Ms. Beebe, do you have anything to say to conclude? I mean, it came past yesterday. My neighbor told me it came past there. It's going to be like, you know, temporary storage of cars if I'm working on them. And they probably caught the came past and saw a couple cars. If I'm doing cars for dealerships, they're not going to have tags on But the, the dealers, they come right to pick the cars up. It's just temporary storage, like, and I have my own lot. Ten cars. Okay, when you say temporary, what's... I mean like a day or two, you know, just until I inspect them or check them out, that's it. Okay, anything? I have something I'd like to add. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to add that before we went into a lease agreement with Mr. Spence four years ago, um, we did meet with Baltimore Development, mm -hmm. Kristen Mitchell. We were concerned because you know, the last thing we wanted to do is get him in there and then something go wrong. And, um, and I know that Javon has had conversations with them as well, as well as Regina. Um, so, you know, we tried to do the right thing, up, you know, four years ago uh, before we even considered having him move in to make sure that everything was fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, 2014-534-1181 through 85 James Street, Tracy Scudder. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And, sir, your name is? Uh -huh. <laughs> My cousin. Understood. All right. Do we have staff reports? Uh, yes. We have a letter in opposition from a resident at the 1200 block of Grindon Avenue. Glendon Avenue. Uh, at the community meeting regarding this request, there was not clear direction about exactly what the plan is for in this building, just a general idea. Seeing the plans makes me concerned for what this may, may come of this. We already have two community centers under one mile from this location. I have concerns about parking. One side of this entire block has no parking due to the fact that it backs up against Sargent Street. And so, it is the driveway access for all the homes on that block. This area of James and Ostend has a lot of illegal activity and my concern is that this will be a place that gives people a legitimate reason to hang out and create more havoc on our community. There was no plan for security and safety of the residents. How will foot and car traffic be handled? We wish to keep this area intact as residential and not to see it cut up into tiny areas with mixed juices, corner stores, liquor stores, etc. <laughs> and we have the planning department's report. Thank you. Planning department noted that the uh, current use of the property is a non-conforming commercial use. This is an R8 general residence district zoned property. 
Uh, the issue here basically is that the lot area that would be consolidated would only enclose 1,841 square feet approximately, and it does not meet the requirement in the zoning code for 5,000 square feet of lot area for a conditional use such as a multipurpose neighborhood center. The issue then is that the amount of variance of the required lot area would exceed the 25 percent maximum discretion that is allowed to the board by the zoning code. For the basic technical reason, therefore, the Department of Planning recommends disapproval of this appeal because the amount of lot area variance that would be required for approval would exceed the discretionary authority provided to the board in the zoning code. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Scudder, um, why don't you tell us about what you're proposing here and um, I guess we can get to what planning has to say in a moment. Okay. Um, well, the applicant in this matter is Friendship Apostolic Church of God. And the pastor of the church, um, Samuel K. Scudder Jr., is present here next to me. Uh, the subject property is um, located in the R8 General Residential zone. Um, it's located in the herbal, urban renewal plan area um, and it's uh, being retained under the same zone of RA under the new zoning code and thus we believe that the use that we are contemplating for this location has already been contemplated under the new code. Um, as Ms. Mr. French mentioned, these um, two lots do not meet the minimum lot area requirement. They are exceptionally small lots even though this is a corner property, the two lots, one, lot 129A, consists of only 711 square feet, and lot 130 consists of only 1,131 square feet, so for a combined total of 1,800 square feet for these two lots. So as you can tell, they are exceptionally small, really for anything that would be proposed at this location. I have combed through the zoning code and looked at all kinds of uses that are, are per, would be permitted there and really on a from a commercial perspective nothing would work at this location without variances being granted as to the minimum lot area it's it's just these lots are just you know inherently small um, the applicant has been pursuing the proper channels to bring this neighborhood center online it would be a meeting place for persons who are involved in outreach in the pig town and immediate surrounding areas. Um, it would not only provide meeting space for volunteers and staff of the center, but it would also provide a place uh, to hold um, meetings with the clients that the uh, outreachers are servicing. Um, it would provide a place for them to have um, counseling sessions and speakers um, as well as, you know, social events that people in the community can par partake in. And when I say social events, I don't mean <laughs> parties. I mean, you know, activities for people that they are providing outreach to. Um, so this building has been um, vacant for some time now. Um, I attended the most recent Pigtown Association meeting in January. Um, that's a very active community, as you all know. There are a lot of uh, members there, and there was a police report that was given, and one of the things he said was a big problem in Pigtown is that there are a lot of vacant buildings. And this building was a, you know, it's a vacant building now. It's boarded up, and the police reported that it's a problem because, you know, people enter the building, and sometimes fires are caused um, because people are rigging the wiring to get electricity. Um, in fact, that was the situation when the church bought the property. There were squatters in the building that had just somehow <laughs> gotten in and taken up residence, and um, we had to go through quite a lengthy court process to get them out, but they were living there with no electricity. Um, BGE had a open is it BGE had an open fraud case because people were just you know somehow rigging the system and getting illegal electricity. Um, so at any rate, um, we are here to um, request um, two variances: one with regard to parking, um, which this board has previously approved. Um, for um, a previous applicant back in 2011, I believe, um, there was an applicant that was proposing to do a convenience store 
at this location with two dwellings on top and the board granted 100% variance as to parking. And so we would request that same variance for the neighborhood center. Um, this is not gonna be a high generating traffic use. It's not like a, when we say neighborhood center, we don't mean something you know akin to maybe a YMCA. Um, we're contemplating just a few staff members there, two or three, four at the most. So um, there, and we also expect that a lot of the people that we'll be providing services to will probably um, take public transportation or um, walk to the facility. So um, we don't believe there, this would cause any type of parking problem. Um, it is on the sort of back street of the neighborhood and across from the building there is a wall, kind of like a concrete, I wouldn't call it a retaining wall, but there's just a wall that runs all the way down the street, but right adjacent to the wall is street parking. So there's plenty of um, street parking available for this to support this um, use that we're proposing. Um, we are asking for a significant variance. We understand that and we knew that this was gonna be a, an uphill climb for us today, but um, we believe that this board has um, the authority um, as long as we can show practical difficulty in this um, situation and I, I believe that we can given the again the exceptionally small nature of the lots um, the development pattern that has uh, materialized over time with regard to parking um, I think that does present the kind of practical difficulty that would justify this board granting the approval of the variances so, so. Uh. development alternative from a commercial perspective. Um, did you mean that um, this commercial use is the only realistic use or that this use is really the only possible use, whether you use it um, commercially, whether you use it residentially, what have you? Um, I believe the only use that would not require variances by the Board would be um, if it was a single family home. Um, even other residential uses like multifamily dwellings would require a parking variance. So, again, I can only think of one use that would be outright permitted um, at the location, and again, that would be single family. I see that the prior. History Day, was that correct? We've got it as a contractor shop? Yeah. Well, the board approved two dwelling units and a convenience store. That never. Yeah, they never got their. Their, um, yeah. They were never able use to. Use occupancy permit. Complete mm -hmm. that job. Mm -hmm. Was there any work begun on it? Not to my knowledge. I don't know. Um, and Ms. Scudder, did you look at it as uh, with the possibility of basically doing what was done before? Um, the, uh, the it's, it's, uh, use the first floor as a convenience store and the second floor as two dwelling units? Well, that's not really what the church is in the business of. They, you know, are in the business of you know, outreach and that community, even though Pigtown is a, co a community in transition, um, there are still a lot of um, problems that are very apparent when you're, at least on James Street, you can see people walking around that y you can tell that are in need of help. And so I think that this neighborhood center could be a great partnership with the Pigtown community in reaching out to persons who may have you know, maybe drug addictions and, and just need some, you know, positive, you know, influence in their lives. So when did the church born? December of uh, twenty thirteen. Um, and when it was purchased was were there any um, uh, representations made about um, development possibilities? 
Um, so you, how was it marketed? Um, we knew going into the purchase that um, because we did request a zoning verification letter, so we wanted to make sure that what we were proposing is something that would be permitted. We knew that we were going to have to meet the requirements um, and that there and we would have to come before this board to request variances, but we believed that approval of those variances would be possible. Any other questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Next one up. Um, 2014 582, 13 through 19 South Chapel Street, AB Associates, care of Nate Prettle. Call that together with 2014 583, 25 through 31 South Chapel Street, also AB Associates, care of Nate Prettle. Afternoon again, Mr. Prettle. Afternoon. Um, we have, as to both of these appeals, the requests are to consolidate the lots, subdivide into three lots, and construct three new three-story attached single-family dwellings with lower-level front access for uh, one-car garages, second-floor rear decks, and rooftop decks accessed from fourth-floor penthouses. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, although the application has been slightly modified, and I can explain the changes that have been made. Okay. We'll get you sworn in, and then we'll... Uh, Address those changes. Okay. Okay. Ah, that's right. You were already sworn in. So, staff reports. <laughs> uh, first, we have a letter from Purchase Hill Land Use Committee. They write that the appellant and architect submitted amended proposal. The appellant has also been informed <coughs> us that the developer has received support from the property owner of 23 South Chapel Street but has not been able to contact the owners of 21 and 11 South Chapel Street. Due to the close proximities in this block, we encourage the developer to communicate with these owners and discuss the uh, design and construction of the project. With these provisions, the Land Use Committee feels the proposed new townhouses will be a welcome improvement to the neighborhood. We have received a letter from a resident at 1936 East Lombard Street. He writes, due to work conflicts, I will be unable to attend the February 10th, 2015 meeting of the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. I ask this letter to be entered into the public record in relation to these two cases. I have had an opportunity to review the design plans at a February 9th, 2015 meeting. I have no objection to subdividing eight lots into six. The current lots are narrow, and this is a reasonable request. It is unfortunate that so many front doors and stoops will be replaced by garage doors. This will severely change the streetscape, but the benefits brought by increased off-street parking are likely worth this trade-off, and I have no objection to adding six garages to the street. My only significant concern relates to the overall height and massing of the buildings on such a narrow one-way street. The developers propose demolishing two-story row homes and replacing them with much larger three-story row homes with a fourth floor roof deck and roof access penthouses. This is not a reasonable request. The total overall height of the proposed townhomes would be similar in scale, should be similar in scale to the existing townhomes on the street and the immediate vicinity. The proposed townhomes are similarly sized to those put on the 200 block of South Ann Street, but South Ann Street is a two-way street with parking on both sides. It is not a nine-foot wide street with no street parking. Can fire equipment that would be needed to fight a fire in these buildings so that height navigate navigate that block of South Chapel Street. From the plans I saw, the developers should be able to accommodate height concerns into their existing plans. 
If not, it is clear that redevelopment is coming to that block one way or another, and perhaps another developer with better, fresher ideas will be able to design a plan that works both financially for them and as well for the neighborhood. And we have planning reports. Thank you. Planning Department has reviewed this application. Notes, as was noted in one of those letters, this is a back street or narrow street in Baltimore City. Nonetheless, the department has no objection to the front-loading garages that are proposed. The department has no objection to the appeal as a whole, as the proposal is to raise and replace existing attached single-family dwellings. The applicant is not obligated by provisions of the zoning code to provide any off-street parking in association with the proposed three new attached dwelling units in each of these two appeals. If the application is approved by the board, the approval should be subject to the conditions that the proposed site plan be approved by the Department of Planning and the proposed subdivision be approved by the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Prudle, uh, are, you mean, are you amenable to the uh, conditions stated by the Planning Department? I am. All right. Um, and why don't you touch on the revisions that you uh, had referred to and then also um, uh, let us know what's going on. Sure. With, uh, this proposal. Sure. I'll give you a brief overview. So, uh, I'm Nate Predall, AB Associates. I'm here on behalf of the Donovan Development Group for the property owner of these eight parcels on South Chapel Street. And that represents about 50% of the total parcels on here. There's four. It may be helpful actually to look at this block plat with the properties highlighted. It's four, two in the middle, and then another four. Our proposal is to demolish the existing structures, which exist on six out of the eight parcels. Two of them are vacant consolidate the lots and resubdivide into two groups of three, so six total. And there would be new three-story single-family attached dwellings with front-loading garages. The change that we've made since the original application is to remove the penthouse structure. There is still a roof access structure, but that was done within the guidelines of the Butchers Hill Neighborhood Association. They requested a 75-foot stair access structure, which is what we provided after several back and forths. Um, one of the issues that came up in that letter has to do with the front-loading garages. This was essentially a condition from Butcher's Hill that if we're doing new construction, we provide parking to ease the parking requirements in the neighborhood. So, and um, when I get into the variances, that, that'll play a large part as well. Uh, which I guess I'll mention right now that we are asking for two variances, one for rear yard setback. We're providing a 17-foot rear yard in, uh, instead of an 18-foot, 9-inch requirement and we're providing 72% lot coverage in, um, instead of the 60% requirement. I should mention that both of these are less than what's provided here. The existing structures go within, it varies between 5 to 10 feet of the rear yard and cover closer to 80 to 85%. Of, so we're providing um, a relief in that sense. We're also providing parking, which the, addition, um, the existing houses did not provide any parking. We're meeting the zoning requirements in that. With consolidating the lots, we're also meeting the city's 16-foot uh, minimum dwelling width, which the original structures did not. So in my opinion, these structures are bringing all the homes into compliance with the bulk regulations of the zone and the density regulations of the zoning code as well. I should mention we're at two less houses. We've uh, done significant community outreach. We have the support of the neighbor at 23 South Chapel Street. We have the support of the Butcher's Hill Neighborhood Association. We've attempted to contact some of the other property owners on the street. I think there's only one owner-occupied structure on this block of Chapel Street. So um, we haven't had any luck with that. The, uh, property, the new properties are unique in that the 16-foot dwelling width is unique to Chapel Street. They're also unique in that we're right across the street from the St. Michael's Roman Catholic Church, which you know what other uh, properties are in this area. The hardship stems from the fact that we were asked to provide parking, and fr frankly, we wanted to provide parking on the first floor, which the original houses did not have, which caused us to seek a little more floor area, moving the houses back towards the rear lot line. So that's where I build myself up to any questions at this point. Frankly, this is a, a pretty distressed block of Chapel Street. As I mentioned, there's only one owner occupied. There's about eight vacant houses on this. So in most of our conversations with Butchers Hill, this was seen as a welcome for the not only the neighborhood as a whole, but especially this block. 
So there's going to be a total of three bedrooms? Correct. One thing that was discussed is possibly adding this fourth story penthouse and making two car garage parking on the first floor. That was something the neighborhood didn't want to discuss, so we ended up not going with that plan. They thought that only having one parking space was preferable to having an additional story on top. All right. <clears throat> Questions? All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. 2014 585, 201 through 31 South Compton Street, Caroline Hecker. Afternoon, Ms. Hecker. Okay. Uh, and there was opposition that it signed in. Were you able to get something worked out? Um, no, really, Mr. Burke was here. Okay. Uh, but we had, had a, we had a very nice conversation. Okay. Uh, so the application is filed on June 1st, 2014. Chris Taylor, a representative of the applicant, Urban Phoenix Holding Corporation. Okay, and Ms. Hecker, we have this as an application to subdivide the lot, retain the church, and one school building on the, on the one lot, use the former second school building as 26 dwelling units and two efficiency units, including 10 off-street parking spaces. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, sir, your name for the record? William Corbin. Okay. All right. If uh, all those giving testimony can raise their hands and be sworn, please. Peace, we're referring to testimony. You're about to give this hearing. All right. Do we have staff reports? Uh, yes. First, we have a letter from the Hollandtown Community Association. They indicate that they are in support, provided an MOU with the eight items is agreeable to the applicant. Should the applicant not agree with the MOU, then they would ask that the appeal be denied. Do we want to go over the terms of the MOU? We We've signed the MOU. It's, you okay. should have a signed copy of it. Okay. And then we have plannings report. Is that a part of your uh, packet? It is, yes. Right. Okay, thank you. Planning department notes that this proposal is to convert an existing building into residential units. The amount of lot area that would be required under the proposal as provided in the application would be something that would require a variance of 28 percent, which exceeds the board's discretionary authority of 25 percent. The amount of the difference basically is consisting of one dwelling unit. Therefore, the department notes by way of suggestion that if the application was amended to provide for 27 apartments rather than 28, being two efficiency units and 25 dwelling units, then that would bring the amount of lot area variance required within the board's realm of discretion under the zoning code. On that basis, the department would have no objection to approval of the appeal if it is amended that way, subject to the condition that subdivision of the property to create the proposed lot is also approved by the Planning Commission. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Ms. Hecker, I think the breakdown here is over the one dwelling unit, is that correct? Between us and the planning department, yes. yes. Mr. Um, Corbin, I believe, has concerns about the parking. Yes. Well, I meant as far as the others. Typically, I ask if you're amenable to the condition stated by the planning department, but I'm guessing that you're not really because of the... Because we have an existing building that we're working with, and in terms of the internal configuration, I'll, if I can explain a little bit about what we're doing. I've handed out packets to everyone, um, which shows some um, existing photos of, of what's there right now, as well as the development plan um, for the proposed subdivision and the interior layout of the building. As you noted, we're here for uh, two variances today, one of which is a minimum lot area variance to allow uh, 26 regular dwelling units plus two efficiencies, it would be 28 total units. Um, and as a result, that, that would require, by my math, it was a 29% uh, minimum lot area variance. I, Mr. French said 28, but I think it is 29%. 
which we acknowledge does exceed the 25 percent that the zoning board has the authority to grant under the, the ordinary provisions. Uh, the second variance that we're here for today is a parking variance. Um, we're providing 10 parking spaces within an interior courtyard of the building, um, but the, there would be uh, 28 spaces required, so we would need a variance for the remainder there. The building, it's an existing um, property that's owned by the uh, Archdiocese. It's Our Lady of Pompeii Church. It was founded in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the school has been, over time, uh, K through 12. It was K through 8. I think at one point it was a high school. Um, and what we're proposing to do is subdivide the school portion um, and have that converted to apartments for residential use. These are market rate, high-end apartments. Um, and there, it's a, approximately a $4 million investment in the, the property. The church is going to retain the, the existing church building and the gym. They continue to use them. Um, but the church has determined that it, as a, a practical matter, it's seen enrollment decrease in the uh, parochial schools across the board. And the school closed down in 2011, and they haven't had a use for the school por portion of the property since. So as I mentioned, we're proposing to subdivide the property um, and use the, the school building for 28 regular dwelling units with two efficiency units. Uh, this is a historic renovation. We're going through a historic tax credit uh, process and the, you know, the interior layout has all been, is being reviewed by the appropriate historical uh, authorities to make sure that we retain as much of the historic structure as we can. And in that layout, we, we end up with 28 total doors, it's 26 regular dwelling units and two efficiency units. Um, you know, Mr. French mentioned that the planning department would support it if we could reduce it by one total unit, which would, uh, we would end up with um, 24, efficient, 24 regular units and three efficiencies. That's really not our preference. Um, you know, I understand that if the board were inclined to, to not grant us the 29% variance we're requesting, we would request that in the alternative they grant us the 29, the 25 percent that planning would support. But you know, again, our because of the way the building is configured right now, it, we would end up with um, you know some some real unusable space or some unmarketably large units if we were limited to the, the strict 25 percent. Um, the property, you know, it is unique. It has a, an existing building that has been there since the early part of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, we're, we're severely limited by the size and location and shape of that building. There's an interior courtyard, as I mentioned, where we're going to provide 10 parking spaces. We would love to provide more parking. And we had an extensive conversation with Mr. Corbin about the parking. Um, you know, I'm sympathetic. I live in, in Canton, which is not far away and suffers from a parking problem as well. Um, got lots of parking in South Baltimore, parts <laughs> of it anyway. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we would love to be able to provide more parking, but the fact of the matter is that there's only a very small amount of area on this lot that isn't already improved by an existing building. And so we're going to provide as much parking as we can, um, but that is, is only amounts to 10 spaces. The other thing is that, you know, we've applied for parking variance because we don't, we can't find any historical records about the use of the building in 1971. We know it was a school. But in 1971, parking for the school would have required one space per two teachers, and we don't have records of how many teachers the school had then. It's possible that the building is actually grandfathered for the amount of parking that it would have to, be, have to provide based on its use in 1971. Um, but we unfortunately haven't been able to, to determine that. But if you were building a school today, obviously you would have to provide lots of parking, um, which is why you know, bringing this back to, to using it as a school really is, is not feasible. I mean, they, they have exactly 10 parking spaces on site, and it, um, you know, I think that's part of, part of the difficulty in using it as a school. Um, but you know, we, we are obviously constrained also by the, the historic nature of the building and the desire to rehabilitate it in a way that maintains the historic character um, of the property. Um, the, you know, and these conditions obviously are conditions that were in existence long before Urban Phoenix had an interest in the property or had an interest in redeveloping it. Um, and you know, it, again, this is really based on a desire to be able to use the entire building um, in the most uh, efficient and, and feasible manner. We, you know, like I said, we can't expand the parking lot when, we, if, when we've designed the interior to accommodate the historic standards. Um, Again, this is a $4 million investment in the community, which is significant, particularly in this part of town, which is, um, you know, we, we had a long conversation with Mr. Corbin about the crime that has been in this community over the last several years. And this, this redevelopment really is going to bring new life to, uh, to the neighborhood and bring new residents who, you know, want to be there. These are, again, these are market rate rentals. 
Um, we think there's a high demand for people who are going to live there. Also in your packet, you'll see that there's an article from ABC2 um, News, which was, it was a thing on TV and a, an article online um, that, you know, explained how, how excited most of the community is about having, uh, having this property redeveloped. It furthers the mayor's goal of uh, adding 10,000 new city residents. It'll bring, uh, hopefully, at least 28 new people to the, the area. And as Mr. French mentioned, or excuse me, Mr. Henry mentioned, there is a letter um, from the Highland Town Community Association in your file, which includes eight conditions that we've agreed to. It's a memorandum of understanding. There should be a signed copy in your file. We're agreeing to provide security cameras on, um, on the sides of the building outside. We're installing exterior lights. Uh, we're, we are agreeing to maintain our dumpsters as shown on the plans. Uh, we are supplying a point person for the um, Highland Town Community Association to contact. We're installing trash receptacles. Uh, we're expanding the tree pits. We're limiting the amount of signage that will be on the building. And we have agreed to make ourselves available to meet with the community association within three days of any request that they make of us. You know, particularly with regard to the lighting and the, the um, cameras that we're installing, this really will improve public safety in this area tremendously. Um, and you know, we're sympathetic, like I said, to, to Mr. Corbin's concern, but we think that there are trade-offs to be made. And this is a case where you know the the, the new folks who are going to move into this apartment will bring some vitality here. And you know, the alternative is that we're going to end up with a vacant structure that um, really isn't isn't usable if it can't be redeveloped. Um, if, if we're limited to the 10 parking spaces that we have, it would be 10 units, which is really un, entirely unfeasible. Um, but even if it's limited to the 29, the 25 percent, you know, we, we really feel like a, a, the better and more, more efficient use of the existing historic structure is to allow that one extra additional unit there. Um, okay, on the um, number of units. Yes. Um, I looked through your submission and um, you say that the board is ordinarily restricted to 25% uh, limitation on variances, but then there's the unusable lot um, uh, um, provision. Mm -hmm. um, now, in order for the lot to be unusual, well, unusable, it would have to be unusable for any purpose. Um, and so are you saying that if it were to be 25 dwelling units and two efficiencies, that that would be unusable? It would be less usable. Um, but not unusable. Parts of the, a portion of the building at least would be unusable. Okay. Because um, well, um, and if I heard your presentation correctly, you sort of presented it as an either or scenario that, well, if the board wasn't inclined to do the 29% variance, the board could grant the 25 units, which would be within the 25% variance limitation. Um, uh, but there, you know, the board can't choose door number one versus door number two for you. There has to be something that the applicant really comes up with and you know, presents a plan and says, this is what we want the board to approve. So it's really kind of incumbent upon the applicant in this, in this scenario to tell us which door you're choosing. May I have one moment? Sure. I'd like to clarify the first thing. Uh, a fine point, perhaps, but when we calculate the lot size uh, de for density, uh, we take the um, maximum number. The maximum number of permitted dwellings on a lot is determined by dividing the total lot area. Uh, that by the lot area requirement that applies to the district. And in our aid, it's 750 square feet per dwelling unit. However, if there's three or more, uh, a fraction of the total area, that is 50% or more, uh, counts for an additional permitted dwelling unit. So 
I believe the calculations that were done did not take that into consideration. So applying that 50% to for fractions of lot area, uh, for 26 dwelling units and two efficiency units, the um, variance required would be 27.8. Uh, for 25 dwelling units and two efficiency units, it is 25%. So it's a difference of 2.8% in between for one for that one dwelling because it, you can take a fraction. So I know it's, a, you know, we may be splitting hairs, but I wanted the board to have the exact figures. Thank you. Okay. Fine. Ms. Hecker. Sure. Perhaps we could hear from Mr. Corbin in return to this. Uh, sure. Okay. Um, my concern is parking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now there, there's the, the surrounding neighborhood. You know, I live in a block directly across the street. And Pro's are very nice. You know, the lighting, the cameras, like it's great. But there's not enough parking now. Um, and at least part of it, speaking for myself, um, I work 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. And I come home that late in the evening. And a lot of times, not that I don't need the exercise from the walk, but parking four, five, six or more blocks away, especially depending on the weather. Like last night when I got home, it was icy. You know, taking a chance on slip and falling. Um, you know, plus you've got at least two to four spaces that could be freed up on every block by removing the no stopping from here to the corner stops. Um, I understand that on certain corners you have the fire hydrants, and I'm all for the fire hydrants staying right where they are and not being blocked. But the other concern is, is when the church has a funeral, they put cones out the night before and will block off anywhere from three to four parking spaces right directly in front of the church. And when they're having mass, I've observed that most of the people coming to mass for services are elderly, and a lot of them have walkers or canes, so they can't park very close so that's another concern um, and I, I know and there have been times when say late in any, like on a Sunday evening for example I think of something at the last minute I need to run to the store and I don't because I'm afraid when I get back I won't have any parking um, you know and I know that most of my neighbors are supportive of this and a community association but I just don't think there's enough parking infrastructure in the neighborhood to support the additional. I know that they're going to have the 10 off street, but if you have at least one person every dwelling, you may have two people staying in a dwelling, they could have two cars. There's just, you know, unless the cities, you know, come up with any ideas or their proposal, that's my opposition to it is the parking infrastructure in the area. It just, you know, as a matter of fact, one of the pictures they provided the car that's parked on East Pratt Street. He lives on the 100 block of South Conklin Street, so he can't even get a spot in front of his house. Uh, apparently, I think those color pictures were taken on a Thursday during the day because you tell the one side of the street there's no cars there. So it's between noon and 3 with the street sweeping, and that's another thing. The street sweeping, all the cross streets are early in the morning, and Conklin Street itself is afternoon. Um, no parking, so... You know, that's my opposition, is the, the question of the parking infrastructure. I can respond briefly. Um, sure. With regard to the, we had this conversation on the hall about the parking signs on the corners and, and bring that up. It turns out that the Highland Town Community Association is working with the city already to have those signs removed. And that should add at least one new parking space on each corner of several blocks in the immediate vicinity. And also the community association is working with the city. There's apparently a city lot that's about two blocks south of this site um, that they're, they've worked with the city to have paved and to make it available for neighborhood parking since it's unused by anyone else right now. So we're hopeful that that will address somewhat the concerns. Um, but, you know, historically the church has never provided any parking. So, you know, the parking for masses and funerals and whatnot, you know, a large 
uh, percentage of their parishioners walk to the church from the neighborhood, and they have never provided any parking. So you know, I understand I understand Mr. Corbin's concern, and like I said, I'm sympathetic to it. Um, but you know, we do see this as as sort of a trade-off. The community can get a a real um, shot in the arm, a, a big investment from um, you know a local developer who it would bring new life uh, into the building, and and it certainly is an improvement over having a vacant structure there. Take a lot of, you know, we'd like to see if the city could have it somehow, maybe a permit system or something limited, maybe for the residents of the area. I don't know if that's a possibility or if that's going to be public parking for. I don't know how close it is. There's a shopping center there. Um, I don't, not familiar with the name of the supermarket now. We're seeing Tony's used to be. Um, I'm not sure how close that is because I know Baltimore Street runs behind that shopping center. Um, as far as the overall parking. Um, you know, it's something that we frequently hear from um, uh, community members um, in that side of the city, and I was a little bit flipped before I said we had a lot of parking in South Baltimore. In fact, we don't. Um, it's just not as bad. Um, and, you know, I, my personal feeling here is that, you know, I, I hear the sentiments of, uh, of both sides, that is the um, desirability for um, new development in, uh, in an area that could use it uh, and um, you know, the return of um, a vacant structure to um, vibrancy, but at the same time, there are complications that are posed um, for the existing residents. I think that probably the solution lies in creating some kind of parking facility um, in that part of the city. Um, that's you know, n not really something that we can control here, but that's just sort of my editorial thought there. Um, and that you know, as more and more of these projects, whether they're of this type or they're just simply creation of new housing and then just, you know, there's just more people moving to that area, something's gonna need to be done. But, um, you know, I, I do hear the sides as far as, you know, but, you know, I think that these parking issues can be very tricky. Um, you know, I see what the available facilities are on this um, property. There's at least 10 spots. Um, um, and, you know, but at a certain point, you, know, you can't stuff you know, 30 cars worth of parking into a 10-car lot. Um, but, <coughs> Ms. Hecker. I'd like to let Mr. Taylor say a few words in the hall. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Taylor? Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I, I spoke to William outside. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to meet him at the community association meeting, but I totally understand his concern. It's very valid, and I appreciate you coming out. And like I said to him, none of this is acrimonious. It's not how we conduct our business. He opposes his support. It. We're still going to be open to him. He lives right across the street. He now has my cell phone number. Um, we went to the community, before we even started the zoning application, we went to the community association in Highland Town. Um, I live in Union Square on the west side of Baltimore. We would kill for parking problems half the time. Um, so it's a trade-off like everything in life. I mean, unfortunately, you can't get everything you want all the time. Um, but we went to the community long before we even started the process, and we said very clearly, if you guys don't want this project, we'll walk away. It's just not, our, it's not worth the fight for us to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, everybody was unanimously supportive that night. They had a second meeting only for people who opposed the project and who lived, you had to live on a block that was uh, adjacent to the property. And at that point, everybody, when I walked into a room, everybody was there because they opposed the project. And by the end of the meeting, nobody opposed the project. Um, we had two letters that were submitted to us, cold call. They just, they just sought us out. Either they saw the ABC article or there was an article in the Baltimore Guide um, that live on the block as well. And they just emailed me and said, we want to support the project. Here's your letter of support. Um, so, you know, I think everything is a trade-off. Um, now, in terms of the lot size, you know, we really need the 28 units to make it viable. So our, we're our project to stay is if you approve it, you approve it. If you don't, you don't. I mean, it, it is what it is. We're not here to fight with people. Um, I think, you know, that this is an important lesson Baltimore is going through right now. As I said, I'm a resident in the city. I taught in the city for many years. My wife took 12 years out of her life to teach in the Baltimore City School System. So we're very acquainted with what goes on. I've served for 10 years as the president of my neighborhood in Union Square. Um, so, you know, I mean, Baltimore has to decide, are we going to grow this thing or are we just going to let it lie fallow? And, you know, from an investment standpoint, this is not the area you go to invest. It's, it's, it's down the road. It's in Federal Hill. It's in Canada. It's in Locust Point. You don't see traditionally three, four million dollars uh, invested in an area like this. 
Um, and so we're asking for you to understand our position as this is a risky project to begin with, and we need every dime and every door that we can to justify the expense. Um, and so we're asking for you to approve the variance as it sits. Okay. Thank you. If I could just wrap up really fast. Um, in the file that I handed out, you'll see there are four other decisions of this board in which a lot area variance of greater than 25% has been approved for existing structures that were renovated for residential use, buildings that were not originally constructed for residential purposes, but due to the uh, changing demographics of the city, the the previous use was no longer viable. The buildings had all been vacant, and this board approved variances that exceeded the 25% in all of those cases. Uh, one was 101 South Elwood Avenue. That was the uh, former Highland Town Middle School, 11 East Chase Street, which is the Algonquin. It was an old office building. Uh, 2317 St. Paul Street was the former Land Bank building, and 39 to 47 West Lexington Street was an old BGE building. Um, those all had lot area variances that exceeded the 29% or 25%, excuse me, um, and the 101 South Elwood, the St. Paul Street one, and the Lexington Street one were in excess of 40%. St. Paul Street was 52%. Uh, so the, this board does have uh, precedent for approving lot area variances where the building cannot be used for any, any reasonable purpose uh, without the, the variance over 25%. Thank you. Uh, two of them, I, well, I think actually maybe two at least I recall. Um, with Elwood Avenue, um, the school, as I recall, was tremendous in size. Mm -hmm. um, and same with uh, 11 East Chase Street. That was a conversion, I believe, of an office building. Mm -hmm. um, I actually used to formerly live across the street from that. Um, <clears throat> but it, uh, the sizes of both of those buildings were small. I mean, were large. Um, and so the ability to either return them to their prior uses um, uh, or use them for anything else really was scant. There, it really was pretty. Um, clear that in those cases those structures couldn't be used for anything else. Um, the St. Paul Street and the Lexington Street um, uh, cases preceded me on the board, although I'm familiar with 3947 West Lexington Street. I think that that was another office conversion where similarly the structure was very large. Um, but I don't think that in either, well in any of these four cases, the choice really was between one dwelling unit um, or not. I think it really was a lot larger than that, but that would just be my observation. Okay, anything further? No, thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up. 2014-586, 4500 through 36 Erdman Avenue, Daryl Moore Stone and Jessica Harris. How you doing today? Hey. All right. Uh, you're Mr. Moore Stone? Yes, sir. All right. And, sir, we have this as an application to use portion of the property known as 4500 Erdman Avenue as an artist studio with accessory tattoo shop. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I would certainly be remiss if I did not acknowledge the presence of the councilman, if you'd want to. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, and all those giving testimony, please raise their hands and be sworn, please. Please swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. All right. Do we have staff reports? We have the one letter from Councilman Branch. He writes this letter, sir, a letter to support the Oregon Ridge Homeowners Association in opposition to a tattoo piercing shop to be allowed within the boundaries of this homeowners association. The Oregon Ridge Homeowners Association opposes the approval of the tattoo piercing shop's request to operate because of the following reasons. The tattoo parlor opened for business before the change of the zoning code. According to the Orchard Ridge, the lot is currently zoned for a barbershop business. Two, the community feels that there is enough tattoo parlors in the neighborhood already. Three, 
Bergen Ridge Homeowners <laughs> Association would like to see better commercial businesses in the area, businesses that would be able to employ a broader number of skilled and not skilled community residents. In closing, I uh, would like to thank the board it will, in regards to this opposition. We have planning's letter. Thank you. Planning department noted that this application was denied uh, by the zoning administrator on the basis that this property is in a B2 zoning district and the B2 zoning district does not allow tattoo parlors. There is no indication that there is a currently approved non-conforming use of the property and a tattoo parlor would be a new non-conforming use in the B2 district. Therefore, the department recommends disapproval of this appeal because the zoning code does not authorize establishing new non-conforming uses of properties, which a tattoo parlor would be in a B2 zoning district. Thank you. One question, Mr. Uh, I note here in the data sheet shows that uh, the proposal here is for the tattoo shop to be accessory. Um, I understand the, um, the prohibition against uh, uh, primary uses uh, as a tattoo shop, but is there any kind of um, uh, ability to use the property uh, with the tattoo shop being accessory to the primary use as an artist studio? The, <clears throat> the board has voted in the past, as I can re recollect, to allow uh, a primary use which is allowed under a B2 district with tattooing as accessory use with specific restrictions on what portion of the floor area can be used for the tattooing and in some cases where the uh, tattooing section is located within the total floor area of the premises. Okay. So the answer is yes, it could be done. Okay. All right, Mr. Morristone. Okay. Um, Top Dog is actually an art studio. Um, we do things, uh, we actually do the painting that you guys have on the wall. We, We're the people that you commission, that you were commissioned to do things like that. We do graphic logos. We do, we do airbrushing. We could do that. Um, we actually, we actually have. Um, I wish I'd have brought it. Um, I have, I have different portfolios and things of that nature. That um, we, um, I own a shop in D.C. in Washington D.C. And um, in D.C., it's the zoning is with the cosmetology board. Um, so basically, if you have a barber shop or if you have a, a cosmetology studio, you can do a, you can do a tattoo shop. Um, with D.C., my problem was. The art studio was the situation. It wasn't the problem with the tattoo shop. So in D.C., I had to do more, more so tattoo work in order to, to, to be zoned in D.C., which coming out to Baltimore, I, I was under that. When I, when I filled out the application, I was still in the mental of being in D.C. and conforming to D.C.'s laws. But we do so much more than um, we do family reunion. Um, we do family reunion T-shirts. We design. We're designers. And just so happened in the D.C. area, the tattoo shop was what we could conform to to do that. But we actually do a lot more. Um, we make more money off of our actual um, expertise artwork. We do face paintings. We do. We have. Um, we offer paint classes where we, um, we have paint nights where you can come in and, and you can do paintings on your own. You don't have to just work for Top Dog because artwork is an expression. And what we do is an art studio. Um, and, and we express ourselves. Um, tattoo Shop is just, it's another medium that we use and that we utilize to display our artwork. We do airbrushing on cars. We, we just, we do all types of artwork. And I do not, I wouldn't want us to be restricted to just saying, okay, you guys are a tattoo shop because we're actually Top Dog Art Studio, and um, yeah, we do, the most of the majority of the work is more art related and more the mediums of canvases, more mediums of of anything else. Tattooing is just another thing that we do t to express our artwork. plan showing sort of what the layout of the business is and where the um i didn't um i didn't know i needed to bring that with me unfortunately but um i can i can actually get every anything that we need to comply okay. and to um let you guys know that this is mainly a this is mainly an art studio okay. um how many square feet 
do you occupy in the, it looks to be like a, it's not really a, um, it's almost like a large warehouse complex yes. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, um, the 4500 block, one thing that we um, came to was for some reason you guys have the 4500 block as being the entire shopping center area, which we just have the first unit, which is 4500. Yeah. It, it, goes, it goes down. So yeah, we've got it as 4500 to 4536. Right. 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 Um, so in your little slice of that, how many square feet do you occupy? Um, Looks like you have some help coming. My just sister, her. How are you? Okay, um, um, just a moment, Ms. Uh, Harris, since you weren't sworn in, if you can raise your hand, be sworn. Lady, swear our firm testimony to your best given this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Okay, um, Ms. Harris? It's uh, 1,500 square feet. Okay, 1,500 square feet is the total space that you lease. Um, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and within that 1,500 square feet, how much space would be devoted to the tattooing operation? Um, William, oh, either one. In, in, in the back. In the rear. Two little tiny rooms, like. They're, they're very small. Do you know roughly sort of the dimensions of each room? Nine by nine? Yeah, um, actually, you know what, they're probably 10, by 10? ten. They may be 10 by 10. Two rooms that are 10 by 10 um, located in the back. It's closed off in the back area. It's not anywhere out in the front. Open right. We're gonna have we do airbrushing. We do um, jewelry. We make jewelry. We, we do everything, anything art related. Okay, so the tattooing would be located to the two rooms located in the back. In the rear, yes. Okay, and both of those, just one at a time, please. Um, and um, each one of those rooms is 10 by 10? At the biggest. Okay. Um, all right, so it's not really all that much. Um, and then are you um, proposing any signage to go along on the front of the store advertising the tattooing services? Aside from um, airbrush, we're, we're actually, like I said, um, when we came into this, we came in under, um, more under the DC laws. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't what I wanted to do because I didn't want to be conformed to a tattoo shop. Sure. So um, I, I, I would love for it to be Top Dog Art Studios. And with, you know, airbrushing, um, logos, graphic designs, and tattooing. Okay. All right. Do you have, like, any um, um, signage worked out as far as you know, I actually you do. In the front? I actually do have. Um, we already went and did a sign. Okay. But that's actually being changed because, um, like I said, I only did that sign um, under, the, under the D.C. laws. Okay. So I, I did what I needed, what I thought was needed. So that's actually being changed now to okay. um, conform for the art studio. Okay. And what um, would be the hours and days of operation? We will be working um, Monday, well, um, every day except for Sunday, and the hours would be from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. Okay. And would that be for the entire art studio? Um, uh, or would the tattooing have separate well, that hours. would be um, unless unless someone were to like I said, we do we do paint, we do different we do for different things for the community. Mm -hmm. So unless um, we have something that was actually um, appointed, mm -hmm. as far as with the different different community leaders or um, different people in general, if you want to have something maybe for your kids or things like that, mm -hmm. um, that can be scheduled as an appointment. So we would be able to um, open up early for that. Okay. But so as far the as tattoos tattoo would wise, be by appointment only. Yes. Okay. All right. Any questions? Without disclosing your budgets and revenues, can you give us an idea of what your projected revenue would be in a percentage, not numbers, but percentages, art studio versus tattoo operation? Um, well, in a, in a, at, a DC, at our DC shop, even though it's a, um, even though that shop is a tattoo shop, we still only do. Because tattoos are, are pretty high end. Um, right now, tattoos are pretty high end. Um, you got to spend some good money to get tattoos. So we actually do more business even at that shop. The tattoos is only maybe 
40% of our business, and that is at a and that is at my tattoo shop, where it's, it's supposed to be for, for tattoos. But we do, we do so much. Right, right. Well, the plan in here is to actually be less than that. So it should only be, um, I would say it's 40% there, so we'll probably be doing 30% here. Because I would like to do more, um, we like to do more artwork and a lot, a lot more um, canvas pieces and things of that nature. Okay. Councilman? Uh, my position stands with the no, um, we tried to meet with, um, we actually tried to meet with them um, two weeks ago before we came here, but unfortunately um, I've been in D.C. a lot, so um, that is something I do want to do. Okay. Um, so what you know what the needs of the community association would be? Um, well, right now, um, I, right now, as we put the, um, I did go around, I talked with the people at the, um, at the neighboring, um, I didn't talk with the homeowners, I talked to all the neighboring businesses and um, everywhere around us and um, just tried to find out and, and make sure everything was okay and compliant with them, but I didn't go to the homeowners association um, because we were, because of where we're at um, and, and with the new community in the um, back, I, we, do, we do a lot of talking to a lot of people around there, but I didn't, no, sir, I haven't gone to the homeowners association. Uh, the community I stay with continue to stand with the community association and the letter that they asked me to okay. support them with. Um, and um, since you uh, have brought it up, um, Councilman, thank you for reminding me about it. Um, would it be possible to, um, uh, uh, to meet with the community association possibly? What we've done typically mm -hmm. before, and the Councilman knows um, this from prior cases, but what we've, what we've done um, before when there have been situations where um, you know, an applicant comes to the hearing but hasn't met with um, the community association just due to scheduling issues and all like. Um, what we've um, been able to accomplish previously is that um, we uh, basically um, hold off on any ruling yet in the case. So pending a meeting with the community association, typically the council people can uh, facilitate that, and I know that the councilman is very uh, accomplished in getting that done. But anyways, and the idea is so that um, um, you can meet with um, the community association. It may not be at their formal, um, you know, regular meeting, mm -hmm. but typically there can be some sort of a meeting between um, uh, either um, the executive uh, uh, portion of the community uh, association uh, and the applicant, um, or sometimes they also can uh, uh, facilitate actually a full interim meeting of the community mm -hmm. association of anyone who can come, and that way you can discuss um, you know, your history with them, with your operation uh, in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, they can air your concerns. Um, and what you know, the hope is, is that you know, community associations, when they have these kinds of um, uh, applications, they may not be opposed to them per se once they find out mm -hmm. sort of you know more mm -hmm. about you. Yes, right. um, but they're but in a position there right now they have no information. Right. right. Um, would that be something you'd be interested in? Yes. Very. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so why don't we do this, Councilman? If you can um, facilitate a meeting um, between um, the applicants and the community association. Again, it may not be possible to call a full meeting, but maybe if it's just with the executive um, uh, uh, function of the, uh, the community association, just so that there can be a discussion. Because, um, you know, I think that there's, um, since the um, uh, application here is for an accessory use um, uh, for, a tat I guess, as a tattoo shop and artist studio, um, you know, a lot of times people don't really understand Understand the limitations that come with it, and I think that with a little bit more communication, you might even be able to get a um, uh, some kind of community so, uh, community support behind you as well. Um, you can I add um, one thing. Um, I'm very uh, I'm very involved with the community in DC. Um, I, I work with um, I work with a couple of um, a couple of different organizations. Um, Santa Claus, which is um, part of the Record yes. If you'd like. yes. Um, <laughs> I work with Santa Claus and also SafeShores.org. I do a lot of um, in in DC where I'm at. You know, the neighborhood isn't isn't as, isn't that that great. So I do a lot personally. Um, you know, I, I help I help young kids out. I give them work to do. Mm -hmm. I do things like that. I, I work very 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 um, very closely 
with the community, not on any, um, not on any community chair chair um, mm -hmm. boards, but just as myself, mm -hmm. you know, as a as as um, a young youth growing up in the inner city, mm -hmm. and I also try to show, um, I also try to show other youths how to do things better. Um, you know, I I was born and raised in the city in in D.C. and um, not in the best not in the best surroundings. All of my friends are either either incarcerated or or dead. And um, I don't want to see that for, for everyone else. So I do the best that I can. It's, when people hear a tattoo shop, they, they automatically assume one thing. And um, I'm actually working to, to get out of that. Because like I said, this is more so art. And art is expression. And that's something that I'm actually trying to work with in the schools and work with in different, police, um, different um, places to try to um, make, make more people aware of what's going on. Because you know they're cutting art out of the schools. They're, they're cutting art out of a lot of things, and um, we really need this um, as far as the community goes, as far as everything. The tattoos, we may not need so much, but the art studio in general is something that is, is really needed, and um, we need a lot more of that um, in, in all inner cities, not just Baltimore or D.C. Okay. Um, if you can um, try to get the meeting done, if you can get it done by our next meeting, which is two weeks from now, um, and then just let us know, you know, mm -hmm. how that, well, let us know that the meeting occurred, if there's going to be any um, uh, letters um, that uh, are issued as, uh, as a result of that, then that way, um, when we gather next time, we can deliberate and hopefully um, uh, you know, bring this whole thing to a resolution. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, right. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And we're going to take a five-minute break. <clears throat> Okay. All right, we'll come to order. I'm calling our next case. This is 2014 588 1226 South Clinton Street, CRP Restaurant Investments, care of Stephen Fogelman. All right, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, afternoon honorable Fogelman. members of the board. I'm nice imagining to see you. that it's uh, a little bit awkward for you to be on that side of the table. Well, I've done it before at Liquor Board, <laughs> but let me tell you what's special is being here on a Tuesday instead of a Thursday. Tuesday, it's good yes. to be here. Thank you. All right, Mr. Fogelman, we have this uh, as an application to use the first floor as a restaurant with outdoor table service accessory to the restaurant use. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm here I'm joined today by Christopher Petrie, the CEO of CRP Restaurant Investments Incorporated and the general manager of Lighthouse Tavern, Mr. Patrick McCarthy. Um, okay. This is a little restaurant with 85 seats. It's open six days a week, 1,800 square feet first floor only. Um, I have an updated letter from you. The Canton Community Association was using... Before we get too far down the track, um, let's get them sworn in. Um, I'm guessing that they're going to be testifying. Yes, okay. thank you. I swear or affirm the testimony of the truth that given this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That is the truth. Okay. And I'll ask for staff reports. Uh, yes, we have a letter from the Canton Community Association. They write that at its monthly meeting on January 12th, the development committee uh, was presented with the above plan. Consequently, they uh, are pleased to advise the board that the association approves and supports the request on essentially two conditions. That number one, the uh, proposal complies with the uh, Canton Community Association guidelines for outdoor seating and that the tables be uh, set up diagonally as opposed to directly against the walls of the building. And we have planning's report. Thank you. Planning department reviewed this application and its attached drawing, which was for the outdoor seating area. Noted that the sidewalks on each side of this corner building are approximately 14 feet wide, which does allow ample space for 
there to be outdoor uh, seating. And specifically, that the, uh, the width would allow at least six feet of unimpeded pedestrian passage in front of and beside the premises. Therefore, the department considers the site plan proposed by the applicant to be approvable. The department recommends approval of this appeal, if granted, be subject to these conditions in addition to any other conditions the board may establish. A minimum of six feet of the sidewalk must remain clear and unobstructed for pedestrian use. The capacity of the outdoor seating area will be not more than six tables and 24 patrons. The tables will be limited to those that can seat four patrons and are to be kept against the wall of the building. There will be no outdoor bar, no outdoor music, jukebox, or other form of entertainment. And all patrons must be seated for dining and served by wait staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. And the uh, conditions stated by the planning department, Mr. Fogelman, are those uh, acceptable to your clients? Yes, I've discussed them with my clients ahead of time. They do. They are acceptable. Uh, furthermore, the Canton Community Association has its own outdoor seating guidelines that, mm -hmm. that, that basically encompass everything that was mentioned there. And additionally, they have one other important consideration, which my clients will be adhering to, which is to cease outdoor table service operations after 10 p.m. Okay. I also have an updated letter from them. There was a nomenclature problem. They, uh, the RE on their letter was really not what we're here for. We're here to out outdoor table service as accessory use to a restaurant. I asked them to correct that. They have corrected that. I'm happy to submit a copy of that letter at this time sure, we'll to you. That. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I did bring extra copies. Uh, sure, if you have those. Absolutely. Give those out to the other members. Sure. All right, and the, um, uh, this is an existing restaurant, correct? Yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Yes, That's Mr. Okay. Chairman. Um, and um, what's the um, breakdown as far as food, mm -hmm. alcohol sales, that kind of stuff? Yeah, in the last five months, the uh, applicant has exceeded 51%, or last four months, has exceeded 51% of food sales. Currently, for, for the month of January 15, they're at 54% food to 46% food. Um, prior to that, 52, 48. Uh, what effectively happened is that the restaurant started opening for lunch mm -hmm. to the uh, workers on Boston Street, and that right there, um, change the numbers. Furthermore, um, it, two weeks from now, they're actually entering into an agreement with Order Up, a delivery service which delivers food from the restaurant to the neighborhood. They don't deliver alcohol, so they're not concerned that their numbers, they're, in fact, they're, they're uh, going to be about 60% going forward. Okay. Thank you. It was Thank a pleasure to appear before you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. <laughs> Members, Good to Thank see you. you. Again. Take care. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Next is 2014 593 1900 East Landvale Street, Sorry Bald. Whoops. Uh, okay. Cool. Uh, actually, yes. Yeah, I did. Um, <laughs> sorry, Mr. Green. I uh, skipped over somebody. Okay. You can just have a seat. We'll get to you in just a moment. 2014 590, 203 East North Avenue, Jose Tavares. Sorry, folks. Um, all right, Mr. Tavares, we have this as an application to use the lower level as a carryout food shop uh, and grocery store. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Can all those giving testimony raise their hands to be sworn, please? I do. All right, do we have staff reports? Yes. First, we have a letter from the New Green Map West Community Association. They write that. Uh, they want to express their opposition at this time to the request. Uh, they 
Community Association had the opportunity to meet with the appellant. Uh, and following the meeting, they discovered the following items. That Mr. George applied for an appeal to use the basement of 203 East North Avenue as a carryout location in 2011. Uh, Mr. George's appeal was dismissed and there never was a zoning variance issued. As a result of this, the permit, number USC 2010-538, was issued and as such is invalid as Mr. George has allowed the operation of a carryout business in this building without zoning approval. This further means that the current request is based on operation which are not operations which are not currently permitted and are in fact in violation of zoning. Uh, there are questions about the posting notice causing concern for the community. There are questions about adding a grocery store to the premises. And finally, they, for the purposes indicated on the application filed by Mr. George and Mr. Taveras, states existing use, closed carryout, proposed use, carryout, and grocery store. We look forward to continuing this conversation with Mr. George, but must, in due diligence to serve our community at the highest level, reject any notions to support this application currently. We respectfully urge the board to decline to request the variances at this time. And we have planning department's report. Thank you. Planning department notes that this property is zoned OR, which is office residence, in which uh, either a restaurant or a carryout food shop would be a non-conforming use. The question would be, of course, what is the actual permitted use of the property, as you have just heard. The department notes that the record available to it showed that the last authorized use was actually for a restaurant and coffee shop. There is a plan, an urban renewal plan, in force for this area, which is <clears throat> Pardon me. The Green Mount West Urban Renewal Plan, which you've heard discussed previously in regard to another appeal, which contains a provision that prohibits changing of a nonconforming use to a different nonconforming use. On that basis, if the last authorized use of the property is not a carryout, then the Urban Renewal Plan would prevent authorization of a carryout on the urban renewal plan level by the planning department. The department therefore recommends disapproval of this appeal because the Green Mount West Urban Renewal Plan, which prescribes permitted uses in the Green Mount West Urban Renewal Area, of which this property is a part, does not allow changing the former non-conforming use of a restaurant and coffee shop to the proposed non-conforming use of a carryout. Given the four years which have elapsed since the non-hearing of appeal number 2010-516, which was also referenced in the letter you just heard, and the applicant's statement that the carryout food shop is presently closed, which was on the application, there may no longer be a non-conforming use of the property. Thank you. Yes, I understand. Um, that's why I bought, I bought this. It's a health department permit that is still valid today. Uh, I said it was a closed carry out because they closed in October this year. Um, I belong to the community. I live in the same building, 203. Um, and I even bought food in the place, you know? Um, it was less than a year. And I see that the, um, in the records, it said that there was any business that were any business in there four years, in four years, you know? That's, that's what I have to say. Um, um, I, meet, I meet her in, um, last week, um, Lena too. I was a pleasure to meet her. And they even agree with me that in the community, we need a business like this, you know? They don't have any food shop, any carry out like that, you know? Uh, it's combined, both together. So, that's, that's what I have to say. Okay. Um, in looking at the, um, the permit that you handed up that looked to be a, a, a permit from mm -hmm. the health department, um, 
Although at the top of it, someone has written in void. Do you know? Did you write that in? Did the health department write no, that they, in? No, they did it because it, it's not my name, you know? And I right. just went there yesterday to get a copy because I didn't know that you guys don't have a record that Belly State Cal carry out assist. Yes, and that's kind of where um, it sort of breaks down. Um, uh, because there are a couple of different um, uh, layers of regulation. Um, and while the health department um, may have issued a, um, uh, a permit uh, basically saying that they had inspected it and they comply and that it complies with the health codes, um, it also says you know, it has to comply with all other laws. Um, um, for purposes of this board, um, what we really look more at are um, you know, approved uses of the land as opposed to you know, passing the health inspection and, and, and operating pursuant to the health code. Um, and what our records show is that, um, as Mr. French had indicated, that there was a um, case in 2011 um, uh, case number 10-516 um, filed by an H law. Do you know who that person is? If he's Louis George, um, he's the owner of the building and yes, I know him. Um, well, this is this gentleman's or this person's last name is Law. Oh, no. Um, no. But anyways, they had filed an application um, to use the uh, basement portion of the building as a carryout, um, where would yours operate out of? Would they operate out of the basement level? Um, I'm not sure that guy, but um, the last one, mm -hmm. um, I asked the owner, and the last one, who is this this belly steak cow mm -hmm. carryout? Mm -hmm. um, they operate. They open in April and they close in October the, last year, 2014. Okay. okay, so that operation there opened in April of last year and then closed in October of last year? Yes. Okay. And do you know, were they in the basement of the building? Were the they? Lower level because um, it's not okay. like a basement. It's yeah, there's like steps that lead down as opposed to, you know, if you're yeah. at the street level, you're walking down steps, yeah, you're yeah. not walking up steps. Okay. Yeah, that's um, the same area of the building. Um, and what was being explained by um, uh, Mr. French is that if there's not a prior um, uh, approval allowing um, that uh, business to operate there, um, uh, whether it was this one back here in 2011 or that one there that got the um, health department permit in 2014, um, but if there's not a uh, approval allowing them to use that space, um, then there's not a, it's not a permitted use. It might be a use that's operating pursuant to the health code, which is good because you don't want to have unsanitary restaurants. Um, but as far as you know, legally permitted operation or use of that space for that purpose, um, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and um, the and also as Mr. Um, French had indicated that the last permitted use was as a restaurant and coffee shop and because of the provisions of the urban renewal code um, you're not allowed to switch from one use to another one um, or to a uh, or to a not uh, unpermitted use um, so you're kind of in a tough spot um, I, I, I was confused because of this you know um, and I can understand it's, it's, it's a carry on and it was up in less than a year ago Yes, and, and but I unfortunately, thought, thought that's, okay, unfortunately, that's only a permit that's issued by the health department. And so what the health department comes in and they look for are, they're not looking to see if it's a valid use of the land. Okay. They come in and they say, well, you know, we, you, as a carry out, you have to operate in, 
according to the health code, you have to have sanitary um, conditions. Um, you know, you have to have a freezer and you have to have, you know, washing facilities and that kind of thing. And there's also sanitary um, issues um, that need to, uh, that you need to operate according to. And so they'll come in, they'll do the inspection, but they're doing it to see if you're operating lawfully according to the health code. Um, this is the zoning code which governs uses of the land. So where that one is looking, whereas the health department is looking for, you know, is it operating in a sanitary fashion? We're looking for, okay, you know, is this a lawful use of the land? Is there some permission or is there you know, uh, uh, um, authorization allowing you to operate a carry out in this location, regardless of how sanitary it is? Um, so you know, the, I can understand the nature of the confusion there because you're you're looking at it, you say, I got a permit. Of course it's valid. Yeah, them, them, but um, it's a different, it's not quite the type I understand. of permit I got that mistake because they told me that it, there was there was some um, business open uh, less than a year ago. They were going to give me the Sony permit or something like that. And I, that's why the mistake is... is um, <clears throat> I think we need the zoning administrator's office to uh, do some research here. And um, it may be a good idea to postpone. And there was that zoning appeal that was filed um, in 2010 to uh, use a portion of the premise as a Chinese food carryout. And um, then, Two seven two thousand eleven, a permit was issued to use portion of premises as a um, Chinese restaurant, class three, non-conforming status remains, closed less than one year. So uh, at that point, restaurant no carry out. Right? Yeah, but um, it's still a non-conforming use. Well, and but if uh, I'm understanding the urban renewal provision that you can't switch from the no I understand restaurants to carry out it's um, the board dismissed the pending appeal probably because after a year they if it hasn't it. been perfected we dismiss mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. so uh, they had their permit to use it as a Chinese restaurant. This is based mm -hmm. on the record here. And that permit again was, um, uh, there was another permit issued on April 14th, 2014 to continue to use as a restaurant slash carry out, no packaged goods, liquor sales. Well, when uh, did the carry out get? That's why we need the zoning administrator <laughs> to explain what happened. <laughs> um, if it was something legally legally issued, um, then then you know we go from there. But if it wasn't, then we have to resolve it. Okay. I'm sorry to you know. But, um, but there's obviously some confusion here about the history of it, and it may be worthwhile to at least nail it down to figure out how this all evolved. Are you in contact with the, um, well, you said that you are in contact with the building owner, correct? Yes, yes, okay. he support me. For okay, because um, it may be that um, he may be the, um, uh, the person who's got more knowledge um, than you would here because um, he's been with the property the whole time, um, whereas you're just coming into it. Um, would it be possible for you to get him to attend the hearing next time so you can get some information from him? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, then why don't we um, postpone the hearing? Um, so that he can get here and uh, also we can get some more information from the zoning administrator's office 
um, uh, to kind of shed some light on what exactly has gone on. Okay. Ma'am? Lindsay Esposito, I'm here on behalf of the New England West Community Association West Future letter that was submitted for the record. Um, and I'm here to, to represent the two main points that the community has with this application. Um, the first being this, this ambiguity of was, was there a zoning variance issued, was there not, um, to make sure that we're um, supporting ventures which are, are cleared in their paperwork with the city as they should be and, and operating um, as they should. So that's, that's the first issue. The second issue is some ambiguity related to um, where in the building exactly this variance could be issued for, even if it was put through. Um, the application, the sign that was posted, the data draft from the BMZA state different current uses for the building, um, and we would hate for a zoning variance to be issued to the entire building that would allow it to be used as a grocery or carry out or, or any of combination of those. Um, without having the opportunity to at least have a conversation about that, um, again, with, with uh, Luis, who, who did come to a meeting last week. So there's just a lot of um, questions that we still have regarding this. Um, we're, we're excited that he's a business owner who, or he wants to be a business owner in our neighborhood. Um, we do also need to be sensitive to what we are doing on North Avenue in terms of um, bringing in new businesses. We have had um, a, a history of blight, a history of um, carry out operations that were not operating as, as they should in a way that keeps our neighborhood safe, um, in a way that does not promote loitering, things like that. Um, so these are, are this is a really core issue for us and a very important strip of our neighborhood. Um, and so that is also why, why we ask um, for your consideration at this point. Okay. Um, have you, you said that he, um, I guess that the building owner came to the prior um, community association meeting. Did, was he able to shed any light on the past uses and, uh, and permits that have been issued for this portion of the property? When we met, um, we actually met last Wednesday and we were trying to get a meeting in so that we could hopefully issue a letter of support, which we prefer to do, um, or in this instance, we had to follow up. We were not able to have as many committee members there as we typically do. I was there with the community association president. Um, so our findings were actually done after we had the chance to meet. Um, and again, we knew that we would not have another time this, this okay. All right. Well, um, why don't we um, postpone and then if you can get a hold of the um, building owner. Yes. Um, I also was going to say that our file is kind of late as far as the layout of, um, uh, of the business. Um, whichever floor it is that you're operating on. Um, <clears throat> although I think you did say that's the lower portion. Um, so if you can come with a floor plan showing the layout, um, that will also help us uh, okay. with this issue. And then we'll also try to get some more information from the zoning administrator's office. Okay. Um, and just call us and let us know when you're ready to go forward. Okay. okay. And you've, you can also just coordinate with one another so that um, you, you've got it on your schedule too. All right. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And now we'll go to 2014-593, 1900 East Landale Street, Sorry, Bald. All right. Mr. Green, uh, we have this as an application to use the first floor as a grocery store. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. All those giving testimony, raise their hands and be sworn, please. All right. Do we have staff reports? Yes. First, we have a letter from the New Broadway East Community Association dated February 9th. The New Broadway East Community Association does not support the appeal. The appellant has not made any effort to communicate his comprehensive plan to this community association or its board's representatives. That being said, their concerns remain that there is no need, there is a question of public safety, questions about trash removal, and the urban renewal plan. Unfortunately, for the reasons we stated, we cannot support this project at this time. We have a letter from Councilman Carl Stokes. He writes his letter in opposition to, to 1900 East Landale Street. Uh, the community is on the cusp of being free from drug traffic and occupied by homeowners. 
we do not want to send this area in the opposite direction by allowing a grocery store on the first floor. I have met with members of the association who agree that this project will not be an asset to the community. I oppose this endeavor and hope that the zoning board will support my position. Thank you for your attention to this matter. And we have planning's report. Thank you. Planning department reviewed the application with regard to the Broadway East Urban Renewal Plan. That plan does not appear to prohibit or otherwise restrict the proposed use of the property. However, the department also noted that the last use on record is a single family attached dwelling and there was no reference available to us for a uh, non-conforming commercial use. Therefore, on that basis, the department has no objection to approval of the appeal if the non-conforming use of the property has not been discontinued or abandoned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Okay, uh, to address the discontinuance of the non-conformance, uh, as Mr. French said, there weren't a lot of zoning records available, so I wasn't able to find anything with a vacant house notice which would give us uh, any time, specific dates or anything. I did talk to uh, Mr. Lee of Zoning Administration. Evidently, he had talked with Mr. Baldy prior to his retaining me because um, I came in on the back end of this. Mr. Baldy wasn't familiar with the city's processes. So by the time he retained me, he had actually went through the pro procedure back. Let's see, uh, he obtained his licenses, filed applications for his uh, tax ID number. I mean, he's done everything. He was ready to open up, and then he found out that he needed to have zoning. He called me and already. I looked at it, and my first concern, I explained uh, to him the zoning code as it pertains to non-conforming uses that have been vacant for over a year. And he assured me that it was only vacant for a couple of months before he took over it, and he began his project last October. Um, the second floor is an apartment, uh, to my understanding it's always been an apartment. Uh, he, you said the owner the lives owner. on the second floor? The owner lives on the second floor. Uh, I asked him, had the first floor ever been used as part of the residence for the second floor? He assures me that it hasn't. I have no documentation to substantiate this. I'm going on Mr. Baldy's word. Uh, he did, uh, if you look at the package, he did go, because when I checked for the uh, association directory, evidently the new Broadway East isn't listed in the community association directory, so they weren't contacted by me. Mr. Baldy did go through the community. He has a copy of petitions in the package there where he got people in the immediate neighborhood to sign petitions in favor of having a grocery store there. Uh, at this point, uh, he's, he's extended himself with his own personal money out there. I understand the uh, ramifications of this, but I don't think he did. And uh, at this point, he had no other alternative than to try to see the project all the way through. Now, like I said, uh, he, he's gotten community support through petition. He's went through every possible uh, mm -hmm. procedure to actually open the business, uh, incorporated it and everything, but he wasn't familiar with the procedure. He's, uh, it, it would definitely create a financial burden on him. He'd lose money and possibly his dream of having his own business there. Uh, unless Mr. Tanner was able to come up with some zoning records, I wasn't able to come up with I, I really can't. I have to take his word on how long the property <coughs> had been discontinued as a non-conforming use. And if Mr. Baldy wants to address you at this point, I think if you have anything. No? 
Yeah, okay. Uh, when the, my friend bought the building, uh, come over there, the neighbor say, "Hey, we're gonna store here right now, like a four block uh, east, west, south, no, no have any store. The children know where you wanna buy the food, no do nothing. When the friend bought the store, no not bought the house, no anybody here, no more store. Uh, you go long way if you go buy something. And then I talk to the community, he say, okay." I need to be available for open the store. My friend said, you know, I have money to open the store. I want to help him open the store. I said, all the one house over there in the corner, all them have a liquor store, have a liquor store, no have any store. The children go a long way, no family to go buy the, something. And then I talk to the community, everybody signed the paper. He said, you're available for open the store. I, open, I do everything. When they go to Johnny, he said, somebody opened the store before. No, have one permit. You want to look in the permit before you finish it up. And then I contact them with a help. Everything done over there, only the people wait every day, lock the door. How long we want to open the store? How long we want to open the store? I said, I wait in the journey. Um, were you familiar with this area before you um, opened the store? Sir? Were you familiar with the area before you opened the store? Did you know the neighborhood? Uh, my friend uh, bought this house uh, one year ago, and then I come every week to uh, see my friend uh, and then uh, talk to the neighborhood. One day, I mean, outside the door, one neighborhood coming in. Uh, Oh, who bought the store the house now? I tell my friend, they, why you can open the, the store? Before I have a store, you yeah, know, anybody buy. And my friend said, me and I have money to open the store. They want to help you. Anyway, the, the neighbor want this store to be over there. I said, no, I have ways bought the food. Whatever he motivated me to open the store. Okay, so your friend owned the building. The owner building. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then that's how you came to know of the building in the neighborhood? Yeah, the neighborhood, like, I mean, every day he come over, ask the only, the house available right now for opening the store. The other okay. store is closed, another one is a liquor store. And Did you ever ask your friend um, about um, when the uh, uh, previous business was open? Yes, uh, this I say, my friend to the neighborhood, he say, uh, why you bought the, the house and now you know want to open the store? Everybody before buy here everything, right now is closed. You uh, can't help the people who open their store. The, the Did he ever tell you um, how long the last store had been closed, when it closed? He said, when the, my friend bought the house, he said, it's closed one month ago. After my, my friend bought the house, he lived over there for three months, and then I see, told the neighbor, he said, why you close the store? The, okay, uh, so, it closed about a month or so before he bought it? Yeah. Okay. And when did he buy it? He buy uh, last year, this, the, the house. Okay. All right. Um, do you know what month? Uh, I don't know exactly what month he buy the store, but uh, the October, I start uh, fulfilling, to open the, the store. Okay. Um, but, so, but, but you don't know what, uh, when he bought it? Exactly month, I don't know. I know for last year's, mm -hmm. when they bought the store, I'm going there, I check, uh, I make an inspection for the house. It's uh, February, I do the inspection, and mm -hmm. then you do fill in the house. Maybe you want to take a couple of months before he, the house be applied for buy the house from the bank. And you said he bought it from the bank, this, uh, he, um he bought this property from the bank? Yeah, maybe, I think he, he bought the, the, what's he saying, he bought the, off the house. Okay. Well, do, you, do you know if it was a foreclosure or something? Mm, no. no. Okay. Um,
All right. Anyone have any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. We've got two left. I'm going to skip to 2015-5. Um, uh, Felix Reyes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Reyes? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have this as an application to use the first floor as a carry-out food shop. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. Okay. Can you raise your hand and be sworn, please? We do. We do. Okay. You, sir, your name? Luis Vasquez. Okay. And Mr. Vasquez, your relation to Mr. Reyes? Yes. yes. Good friend. Well, good friend, like a brother. Okay. Um, and Mr. Reyes, are you able to speak and understand English, or do you need um, uh, Mr. Vasquez to help you understand? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You need. Okay, so, so you're sort closer, of translating. Right, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. Um, all right, um, do we have staff reports? Yes, first we have a letter from the Elwood Park Improvement Association, their president. They write that through the years, they've had nothing but trouble from that corner, and we already have enough carryouts in legally zoned locations. There are enough carryouts in the 200 block of North Highland and many, many more along the Pulaski Highway corridor from North Conkley Street North to North Elwood Avenue. It is also our information that carryouts are not legally zoned in the R8 communities. Uh, we would appreciate your support and our strong opposition to this zoning appeal. We also have a letter from Councilman Warren Branch, he writes, this letter serves as a letter to support the Elwood Park Improvement Association in opposing 600 North Island being used as a carryout uh, for the following reasons. There are too many carryouts within the community's boundaries, constant and high levels of trouble, that is littering, loitering, and criminal activity, and feel that carryouts are not legal in our eight communities. In closing, I ask that you stand with me and the community in opposing the request for this establishment to become a carryout. Thank you. And then we have planning's report. Thank you. Planning department notes the property is currently zoned eight. It has been the subject of previous appeals as have just been described. The Application is to use a portion of an existing grocery store in Delicatessen as a carryout food shop by adding a grill to prepare hot fried foods. The problem basically that the department sees is that a carryout food shop is a permitted use in a B2 district, but it is not a permitted use in a B1 district. And therefore, the zoning code does not grant the board discretion to authorize the carryout food shop in the R8 district under the rules of change of nonconforming use. The department therefore recommends disapproval of the appeal because the zoning code does not authorize creation of a new non-conforming use, which a carryout food shop would be in this R8 district. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Vasquez, uh, yes. you can ask um, okay. Mr. Reyes if he understands. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Allow me to say what I have to say. Okay. Okay. What it is? This store has been open close to a year right now. It's a deli, it's a grocery. We got a lot of clients in there, a lot of customers there. They come in there right there. They ask us, since you got deli, cold food, why you don't sell half food? I said, we don't allow to sell half food because we don't really, we don't have the permit to do that. And the customers, they're really brown there, they, to us, to open the hat, you know, like a carry out sub shop, but they ask us a lot. Because almost every day they've been asking for that. So that's the reason we come over here today and apply. If it's any password, they can be in approved for it carry out also too because same we sell a deli, Kofu, you know, we can sell a half food at the same time because a lot of customers they come asking for that. And that neighborhood you know, they every other neighborhood they know us. So that's the reason we come here apply today. Okay. Um and um he um uh, he that is Mr. Reyes understands that carry out food shops aren't permitted in the zone. ¿Qué tú sabes? Dice él que los negocios de Cariaguay no son permitidos en esa zona. 
Okay. He's a you don't know. Okay. Um, that's the. Wait, wait. wait. He say why? Because they got salt shops around, across the street from Pulaski Highway. Why are we? Why would you be able to open one right on the corner? And everybody had. Okay. Well, looking at where the property is, mm -hmm. um, it is very close to an M3 zone. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're talking about over on the other side of Highland Avenue, right. um, there, that's a different zoning district. Mm -hmm. um, and where you're under one portion of the zoning code, over in the M3 district, right. that's different. Um, um, that's going to be my off-the-cuff response mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but uh, I mean, if I'm understanding the planning department correctly, and I'm understanding also what um, the information that we're provided with as far as the prior use um, of the property. Um, yeah, because we got I, no space. I, we got no not space sure to, that to there's. Sell food. We got no space on the store to I'm sell. Sorry? We got enough space on the store to sell house food. Well, I can understand that, and it's not so much an issue about that, although mm -hmm. I don't see that we have a floor plan included here. Do we have that with the. In the file at all, day. but the issue really is more about mm -hmm. what is and isn't permitted under the code, right? Um, and um, the um, unfortunate reality with the zoning district that the um, uh, that the delicatessen is located in is that. Um, it doesn't allow you to convert into um, a carryout. Um, and the board authorized the seller. Yes. In uh, two years, years ago. ago. Mm -hmm. And it was done that way because was we can't approve a carryout. Yeah. Okay. And I. Sure, that was explained at the time. When the press hearing? Yeah, back in December 2013. Right. Yeah. Um, and frequently, um, when we have uses that come up um, as a delicatessen use, a lot of times that's um, uh, that use is chosen because the preferred use is to use it as a carryout, right. but then the carryout doesn't get. Uh, approved or can't be approved rather and so they um, uh, you know, the applicant then will amend it to just be delicatessen which is permitted um, which leaves you when you, you know, I guess you took over the business from this applicant right. and then you know now you're finding out what they found out right. um, which is that you're um, not really able to have the carry out use yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, councilman uh, and if so I didn't get a chance to be sworn in, so <laughs> please, please. I think you were Sorry, previously before. sworn. Okay. Yes. Before, okay. <laughs> no, no comments. Okay. No. Um, so that's just the nature of the zone that you're in, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No problem. No problem. He said there was a carry out before, I, years ago. I buy the boy. Yeah. yeah, years ago. We even still got, we even still got a cell system to go up. Yeah. But that was well, well, I don't understand why they don't want to give me to me. <laughs> the issue there is that that prior use um, uh, had been abandoned. Um, yeah, as I do look at our um, data sheet, I do see that in 1987, mm -hmm. there was an approval yeah. for to use uh, a portion of the we first floor for carry out. Yeah. Um, but that appears to have been abandoned at some point um, because in 2008, uh, there was an application to use a portion as a grocery store while the appeal in 2008 
1987 was to um, use the, uh, um, I guess to, uh, the primary use was be to use it as a grocery well, store. So that was indicating to me there that there was some abandonment of that mm. carry out oh, use. All right. So so that's the problem. Okay, he said that in 1987 it was abandoned by a restaurant and it fell in the zone. And they applied it for a grocery store y la grocery store no fue aceptada. Ahora tú aplicaste para el grocery store y te aceptaron con la regla, pero no puedes aceptarte el, el cariño. So, ¿qué tengo que hacer ahora? Ok, now what do you got to do? You say. Now, <laughs> <laughs> what do you got to do? Well, since, since he was denied. <laughs> well, uh, I think that the only possibility at this point uh -huh. would be to um, <laughs> pass okay. an ordinance and to change the law. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <some things> here, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but short of that, as far as you know, what this board can right. do, is we're just really constrained by what the code Goals. permits right. and what it doesn't permit. Right. And here, it doesn't permit a carry out shop in this zone. Que esa zona no permite carry out ahí porque tiene mucho cerca de ti, que tiene todos los millones, tiene todos ahí. Como hay mucho cerca, no te prohíbe de que tú hagas eso ahí. Está muy cerca. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Bye. Right. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. And calling 2014-595, uh, 1800 South Hanover Street and 1818 South Hanover Street. AB Associates, care of Nate Brother. this is an application to raise the existing structures, consolidate the properties, uh, uh, 1800 South Hanover Street and 1818 South Hanover Street, subdivide the lot into 40 lots, construct 39 single family, uh, three story single family attached dwellings with rear and rooftop decks and lower level garages and a common courtyard. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All those giving testimony, raise their hands and be sworn, please. These swear or affirm the testimony of the people in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I, I do. do. Yeah. Right. Do we have uh, uh, staff reports? Uh, yes. First, we have two letters from the South Baltimore Business Association and a council when Councilman Eric Costello indicating that they support the redevelopment as proposed in the appeal. We have two letters of support from two residents at 1839 South Hanover Street and 1713 South Charles Street. We also have received some letters in opposition. First, don't have an ad, okay. Uh, this resident lives at 1723 South Hanover Street and opposes a development plan for Barney Hanover uh, Hanover Street is congested as it is with heavy traffic from I-95 and the joint and adding townhomes would only increase both the foot and vehicle traffic. In addition, parking is currently horrendous. I can only imagine what 39 townhomes would contribute to the parking fiasco. It is already extremely difficult to find parking, especially with the recent sidewalk reconstruction and the plan for a median. Adding more residents means more cars with nowhere to park, resulting with many more frustrated Hanover Street residents. A letter from a resident at 1731 South Hanover. She writes, uh, the proposed project will eliminate approximately 40 to 50 parking spaces that are fully occupied daily by 6.30 p.m. Every day, every day since residents like myself living on the odd sides of 1700 and 1800 block of South Hanover Street cannot convert their yards to parking pads and must have on street parking available. There needs to be a balance between the land use. Everything cannot be just residential. We have a need for services. The property could re be developed into something more, more that the community needs. There is a concern that these structures are being built 
in a current business zone that has that safety from fire, panic, and other dangers would impact people trying to escape out onto either South Andover Street or Barney Street in an emergency situation. We have already had those situations occur. The developer claimed in a community meeting held earlier this fall that these new homes will increase the value of our homes. We also were told when the we were also told this when proposed apartment buildings and condos were approved on Well Street, Heath Street, and Clark Clarkson Street. However, this has not been the case. We have had a vast amount of vacant houses that currently exist in the 18 and 100 and 1810 South Hanover Street. In the recent 2015 tax assessment that just circulated, many of us homeowners who are still here have found that their property values have decreased significantly since these other buildings have been built. Putting 39 new units in for profit is not a good reason to do this development project. Lastly, Eric Costello has not offered to meet with us at any of our community meetings to address this concern since he became the representative. We also have planning department's report. Thank you. The planning department has reviewed this application. Notes that this is a proposed subdivision which will require review by the planning commission following whatever action this, this board may take. There are requirements for variances. There is also a requirement for site plan review, which has not yet been completed. The department recommends that approval of this appeal, if granted, be subject to the conditions that the proposed development site plan be approved by the site plan review committee and the proposed subdivision be approved by the planning commission. Thank you. Okay, and Mr. Berry, your um, clients are amenable to the conditions stated by the planning department? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, <coughs> I'm remembering this from, I guess, a couple months ago. Yes. Um, and I guess the threshold question here is um, whether there's a um, substantial change in the plan warranting uh, 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 consideration. Well, it's basically, uh, if the changes in the plan are sufficient um, that it be considered a new uh, or different um, uh, application from the prior one that the board considered um, in December. Um, so we'll first um, take that issue and then we'll deliberate on that and then we'll figure out where we go from there. Okay. So uh, let we me can focus on, I guess, the original plan and yeah. then the changes here. Let me bring the board up to date with a little bit of a narrative and why we think it meets the test for a substantial change, although the plan admittedly to the naked eye might seem to be and is somewhat similar than previously. But as we indicated to the board for a prior case known as the Crittenton case, where the amount of variances that were requested on a disapproval were then substantially reduced. Uh, the board in that case found that there was substantial change even though the plan was essentially the same. Crittenden was the same number of units for townhouses, same number of multifamily, but the amount of variances decreased substantially in the Crittenden case. Uh, and the board felt going ahead, going forward, that that constitutes sufficient change to allow that to be heard and ultimately approved. Um, since the September uh, uh, hearing that the board uh, uh, the board uh, made a determination on was not approved, as you mentioned. Um, the developer, myself, and our team uh, worked with the planning department extensively on a variety of issues to, first of all, change the plan and to clarify the subdivision and the original zoning requests and variances needed. Sean Davis, who's an uh, engineer with Morris and Ritchie, will explain the plan and the differences, but in general, the original plan that was approved by or was submitted to the board had 42 homes. This new plan has 39 homes. This new plan has substantial open space that was requested by the planning department to accommodate pedestrian connections to the neighborhood. Uh, we also increased setbacks along Clarkson and uh, Hanover Street for landscaping purposes. And in laying out the revised subdivision lines, 
we went from 42 houses needing 100% rear yard variance from 30 feet to, to zero to now a variety of variances which are less in the case of, and we'll, we'll explain this to you, but the houses on Clarkson Street uh, now have a five foot setback before they had zero. Uh, may not seem like a lot, but it was done again to accommodate the planning department's recommendations on providing access to these rear garages um, and to make a streetscape that makes it attractive. On uh, the other two uh, groups of houses that you'll see, Again, they had a zero setback before, now they have a 15 foot setback before each, leaving between the houses a minimum of 30 feet. Uh, so we think the, uh, the changes affect 100% of the houses and the amount of variances needed go from 100% variances to much less than that. And we think we'd like the board to consider that as a substantial enough change to rehear it. Um, before, unless you want to maybe to help, we could have the plan elaborated on so that physically you could see what these look like. Please, Mr. Davis. Everybody see? Yep. Do you want to just identify yourself? Sean Davis, principal with Morris Ritchie Associates. So for orientation, we have Hanover, we have Barney, and we have Clarkson. As um, Mr. Barry had mentioned, multiple uh, differences between this and the, and the last plan that you saw. First, all of the homes that are fronting onto Hanover have been pulled off of Hanover to provide an additional planting in front of the home at the uh, suggestion of the planning department. Second, the, this was proposed previously proposed as a public street. It is now a private drive, so we've been able to pull the rear yard into the center of the private drive, providing a minimum of a 15-yard rear yard setback for both the homes on Hanover Street and the homes facing this mule. The next major modification was pulling the homes on Clarkson five feet in off of the property line um, at the request of the uh, planning department to provide better access in and out of the garages. The next m major modification was providing a direct pedestrian connection down Clarkson all the way over to Hanover Street um, to, to allow pedestrian movement from, you know, basically from Hanover to Clarkson via this route and providing substantial more open space and landscaping uh, buffers from these homes based here onto our adjacent neighbor here. We've also modified the architectural treatment of these three homes that side onto Barney Street so as they appear as the, the front of the homes. That was a question that was raised by uh, planning department. We've shown that there is provision for additional on-street parking on Clarkson here in this location. Um, and I think that covers all of the modifications from our prior and just to uh, refresh the board's memory, the property itself is an industrial property uh, that was rezoned in 2007, I believe, from industrial to commercial, B23, with the anticipation at the time of residential redevelopment. Uh, I have a number of other arguments about why this should be approved by the board, but in terms of the variances or the, the, the changes. If you want to concentrate on that or ask us any questions. And yeah, we'll take that part first. Um, you didn't have like an overlay or, um, uh, or a board of the prior plan, did you? I do not. Uh, okay, that's unfortunately. But fundamentally, all of these homes shifted to the west. All of these homes shifted to the east. These homes shifted fundamentally to the east as well, mm -hmm. enlarging the open space system here. So all of the homes have moved. All the rear yards have moved. We've lost a, the uh, home that was located down in the southernmost portion to provide for that pedestrian connection through. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had an overlay, which I apologize, <laughs> I don't. That's all right. That's my, my, my job. All right. Um, David, do we have the um, opinion that was issued in the case? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Ms. Rue. Well, that's, I'm sorry, Mr. Barry, if you had anything further. Well, I, I, if, if the board would allow us, we could go into uh, some of the arguments why this uh, uh, should be approved by the board today, uh, if you, if you want to go into that. Uh, as far as the substantive issues, again, addressing the request for variance and the like? Yes. Okay, we'll stick to the, um, uh, the, the issue, change. I guess the threshold question for that. Yeah. 
wait, wait. One, yeah. more, one more additional item, if I can. Sure. One of the questions that was raised by the planning department in our initial application was a question about the curb cuts that were proposed along um, Clarkson Street. And there was a question whether or not they would be permitted. It's important to note that we have gotten the approval from the Department of General Services for all of those curb cuts, which okay. is also a substantial change from the prior plan. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. I didn't know if you were going to grab the. Sorry, it's been taken. That's down. okay. <laughs> There's a lot to go through, I can see. This was the previous. Okay. All right. Just a moment. <laughs> so there, there was 100 percent of the properties had 100 percent rear yard variances going from 30 to zero. Now we have 10 properties going from 30 to five, and we have 29 properties going from 30 to 15. Okay. So we've, we've changed the substantial amount of the variances requested in the previous application. Um, no, we can swear him in. Hi, sorry. Okay. All right, <coughs> Ms. Rue. Uh, sure. Sir, if you can raise your hand, Ms. Swan, please. Yes, <laughs> right hand. <laughs> Okay, um, we're also asking <laughs> the board for um, why this variance is even going forward today for the same reason <clears throat> that you addressed, uh, Chairperson. Um, we're really wondering why in less than 12 months that this uh, variance appeal was um, reconsidered at all. And there's nothing substantially different from what we see and what we were able to review as well regarding um, having one less townhouse than what was actually disapproved in December. It was actually 40, and it's only down to 39. So originally, I know that before we were all involved, that there was a filing for 43, but they were disapproved for 40. Um, there's nothing unique or nothing has changed its practical difficulty regarding this property, 
And once the existing businesses are relocated, which has also been difficult for the, the owner of the business that's on Hanover Street, who I've had discussion with, um, for him to be relocating his entire business, this lot then becomes a rectangular flat lot. So I don't see the practical difficulty of why um, or any uniqueness to the property because there's no reason not to put two rows of, of homes on it without a variance. Um, but this community also is not being served in the fact that the community really needs to have parking. That's one thing. And I know this board only has limitations uh, for that. The most important thing is that this neighborhood, when you come down Hanover Street, that is an evacuation route. And because of the casino, which made it a very unique situation back in October and November, um, and being a resident of 1737 South Hanover right across the street, there is landlock and then there's gridlock. And now we've got the casino. We can have two games going on at either stadium, which doesn't allow for us to move our vehicles from Friday until Sunday. So even if we do move our space, if we moved out of our space in front of our homes, and a lot of our homes are not able to have parking in the back, we go to the grocery store, we come back, our option is to park maybe down by Mothers in Federal Hill and take up commercial space down there, or I have actually had to rent space in the West Street parking garage and get a cab home. And this is totally unacceptable. If we go and we pull in front of our homes, just in the fact that we want to un un unload our cars for grocery, we have to double park, which causes a hazard. We have handicapped accessibility, which is very, very limited now. And there's a whole new, since this whole um, street is now being redone, there's an extension of sidewalk to make it ADA compliant on our side well, that, that kind of gets was part of this back also. Back to the, um, the substantive consideration that we had the last time. The negative impact, um, right. Though I am recalling that, and that's why I wanted to look at the opinion, mm -hmm. that the, um, uh, a large part of the presentation from the opposition and response from the applicant um, uh, and the board um, also considered this in the deliberations with the impact on traffic and um, parking and, and the like. Right. Um, and that was your argument against the, um, the, uh, the variances the last time. Um, and that's also why I wanted to see the prior plan um, and the current one that we can assess sort of on right. those issues, sort of where are we? Um, um, but anyways, I didn't want you to go too far mm -hmm. into um, the issues, um, I guess the underlying issues of the merits of the, uh, of the variances or the variance requests um, and really focus more on just the um, question of is this a substantial change from the last time or is it not? Um, and I think what you had already said was that it wasn't, from your perspective, and I'm guessing that that was an allusion to your prior stated concerns of um, parking, traffic impact, and so that this, from that perspective, is the same. That's one, yes. The uh, new plan that reflects uh, the open space, um, that's an issue in the fact that it was an alley and now it becomes an easement. Um, that's not substantial. It's basically a paved section between homes. Um, the home is not needing a 20-foot rear setback and now only has five. And Clarkson Street is a nightmare. And like Clarkson Street, regardless of the, try the improvements that they were trying to make on this plan, you've got parking on both sides of Clarkson. You can barely drive down Clarkson now. We also have the other building that's being developed with parking only for that building. We just finished the other two buildings on Wells. There's other buildings in the neighborhood, and these same investors are basically in just coming in and 
that's all they're doing is they're not doing any commercial, they're not addressing any of the issues that the residents actually need here. If you know you want to go out and get a gallon of milk, you can't go across the street and get a gallon of milk without getting in your car and driving somewhere to get that. And what the residents initially were looking at is possibilities to reflect some of the things that happened at, McMah at McHenry Row, which we haven't been able to have a, a discussion with either Al or with the investors to consider some of the services that are not here. The overall impact of the neighborhood also, um, it doesn't help stabilize if we don't have essential services. We need a cleaners, we need a barbershop, we need all those things that are not readily available across the street and then directly in the path of this. The other thing that's unique about Hanover Street is that this is an evacuation route from the city. And now you're asking for potentially all of these units to have up to four cars and coming out onto Hanover Street in the morning does have a negative impact on the neighborhood. It does have a, a negative in, impact on the traffic flow. So there's nothing that's unique or different that has changed since the last plan that I see. Reviewing the plan, looking at this. Um, also, I don't see where it's delineated on this new plan that these homes, the width of these homes are on that plan that's right in front of you that this says the, the width, right, or even the new one. The, the width of these houses are clearly defined as far as the width. And then we're looking at two parking spaces or is it gonna become one? And that was a question that we also had. 16 feet. Is the, um, is the width of the, um, right. of the width of the on that original plan? Is. Right, I saw that, but on the actual plan that was just resubmitted, which was this one, this is the one that was actually put in, and I asked for this to be increased, not on just the size of the piece of paper, but for this to be readable. Okay, and we can read the plan, but the thing is, we're sitting here looking at you know, really tiny print and it upsets um, the flow of the folks that were looking at it, even as residents, because we, we just didn't see what you know, the differences were. Um, and we were just asking the board um, you know, that they were turned down in December for a reason because of the fact that this is not substantially different today than it was then, and there hasn't been any cohesiveness as far as the developer and the community and even South Baltimore Association is still taking the assumption that they represent all of us without our impact and without our input and without our voting rights that we should all have and be entitled to do. And that is an issue with all of the residents. Um, the other problem is that some of the residents, because of all of this, um, you want to stabilize neighborhoods, you want to bring people into the, into the city and keep the residents that have been here. Some of the folks that had to leave to go back to work, they're putting their houses up for sale. And that's the last thing that we want, directly across the street from here. And that's a fact. Okay. Okay. Did you all have anything to run into state to this issue? Or <coughs> this is, for right now, it's just the issue of whether or not there's a substantial change in the plan. Um, <clears throat> uh, hi, um, I'm Richard Snyder. This is my wife, uh, Lauren Vernamonti. Um, we are uh, residents of the 1700 block, uh, South Hanover Street. Can you get a spelling on your last name? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's V as in Victor, E R N A M as in Mary, O N T I. So you have you were speaking about the fact that uh, if the issue is at hand that um, if there was a substantial, substantial change from the previous um, submittal to this one, um, from my opinion, uh, there is not. Um, the main thing I, I'm concerned about and was brought to my attention um, uh, four days before a meeting with the developers of this is happening is there was no communication, and then when there was communication, um, it is the decision was essentially made. Um, we fought that before, 
And as, as now we were had issues with communication, I was unaware of this until uh, the resubmittal when the original assumption was that it was a year waiting period and it was submitted within that wait period. Um, and then we were able to rush to try to uh, get the community and, and look at these plans. And I can assure you, um, uh, the past couple nights with freezing cold nights, I personally walked to every resident on 18 and uh, 1700 block. Uh, I tried uh, two, three nights to get people with flyers and information to allow for them to get here to point out what is occurring and the, the difference and to please voice their opinion. And while I did meet th those that did agree, um, I met more that said not. And the more that were like, w that had said that there was no communication from this SBNA as far as what is going on. I've tried my due diligence to make sure that people are aware of what exactly is occurring and how little of a difference it is. Um, one house does not account for the fact that a majority, a fair amount of people in Federal Hill rent and the, and the maximum amount of people that can live in a house are four. I cannot leave my house. Right now, it's five o'clock. I can tell you, I can go home right now. I'm not gonna get parking within four block radius, most likely in my house. I have to be home by five, seven o'clock or else I'm not getting parking. I have to park four or five blocks or I, I park at this place, which is, uh, my wife is afraid to walk home because it's the closest parking and I have to get in the car to go with her because it's uh, where that doggy daycare is. And it is not, it's not great. Yeah, you, the, the, the street can't get fixed. The lighting is terrible. And I can't, I can't assure her safety unless I'm there. And then I have to walk home myself and I personally don't like it. This is not a change. This is something that is going to put more people in Federal Hill that is not a good balance for Federal Hill. There's no balance in livelihood. There's just cramming people in like sardines and it is not going to be healthy for the neighborhood, which I love and I would like to say, I'd like to remain in the city, but I'm being convinced otherwise. And I know that is not what the board wants. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Just to piggyback off mm -hmm. of that, last night was a perfect example of something that happens very frequently for me. I didn't get home last night until 8.30 at night. When I pulled up in front of our house, there were no parking spaces. My husband had to come out and help me unlo unload the trunk of my car with my huge briefcase and all of my testing materials for my job. And then after that was safely in the house, then I was able to park my car. This is something that happens all the time. Sometimes I get lucky and I find a spot that's maybe two blocks away from the house. There's been nights, especially if it's a game night or if, it, if it's particularly cold or there's been bad weather that day, I have driven around for in excess of 30 minutes. The problem is that, the, what, the main problem I see is that these homes are being marketed as single family homes. Federal Hill, is a renter's market. There's not a lot of uh, us homeowners and taxpayers who are just a single family. Most, most of the new residents that we see coming into these homes are young, 20-something recent college grads living with two, three, four roommates. So when I see this plan, I assume that four people are going to be living in most of those homes, which is at least four cars. The traffic congestion, as Lee said, is already really bad. On a, on a game day Sunday, I'm not moving my car because I know if I do, I will not be able to park my car when I come home. We're thinking of starting a family. I don't know how I'm going to come home with groceries and a stroller and a diaper bag and not just wanna cry because I, I don't know how I'm going to get back into my house. We are landlocked for entire weekends. And after 5 p.m. On a, on, a, on a work day, that's it. And for those of us who work outside of the nine to five, it's a nightmare. So that's my concern. Okay. Um, Martin, was there any consideration within the, within the planning department as far as um, the issue of substantial change and whatnot, or was 
that not an issue that was examined? Planning Department did not consider that issue, quite frankly. Okay. All right, All right. Uh, Mr. Berry. Well, I think we're hearing a lot of arguments why this property should not be redeveloped for residential. Um, I think that um, South Baltimore, Baltimore, in particular, many of the board members may be familiar with the, there has been change in South Baltimore. Many of the industrial properties were converted to apartments or they've been converted to new houses. Um, I would again point out that we're providing two spaces uh, per unit. The zoning code only requires one. Um, redevelopment for commercial wouldn't necessarily add parking to this problem that uh, some neighbors are experiencing. And there's a, there's a value, you'll hear from some of the neighborhood association that we met with over several months, including neighbors on this block. There's a disagreement between people that feel that this industrial warehouse uh, ought to be replaced and environmentally cleaned up with new single family homes for sale. You'll hear from the owner uh, in a minute that can testify he's active in the real estate market in that area. He's been involved in numerous redevelopments of similar properties for this with similar variances approved by the board. I would say that the substantial number of variances that have changed is sufficient reason, as it was in Crittenton, the exact same situation, is sufficient reason for you to consider the appeal on its merits today. And on its merits, we can get into issues like the amount of density that's being provided on this site is uh, basically almost exactly the same as the area to the immediate north. We counted up the amount of buildings on the block immediately north from Hanover to Clarkson, the same area, and there, those, there are 40, let's see, 41 attached buildings fronting on Barney, Hanover, and Clarkson in the exact same site area that we have on this site. So we're not overcrowding in this case, uh, as, was, as was mentioned. The density would allow almost up to 96 units on this property if we were gonna build an apartment building. 96 units with 91 parking spaces. That's all that would be required, and nothing would necessarily change. We're, we're reducing the density substantially by this. We're bringing in home ownership. Nobody can, can ne necessarily predict whether somebody rents or not, but the economics of buying a new house, uh, would, and we'll have Mr. Mitchell testify to this, would not lead me to think that many of these, if any, are gonna be rented. Not saying they couldn't be but uh, we are providing two car parking for each one. We also think it meets the standards, uh, which we'll get into, but maybe we'll let Mr. Mitchell, who's a local resident and developer, and as well as the neighborhood association, who has met continually on this and continually supported it. So we have a disagreement, frankly. Shane, do you want to? Sure. Hi, my name's Shane Mitchell. I'm the owner of the property. Um, I've been a resident in South Baltimore since 1993. I've opened a company that's located at the 1100 block of South Charles Street, and it's been open since 1998. We've uh, developed and, and built many single-family houses, renovated many single-family houses, did mixed-use developments, um, both commercial, obviously, and residential. Um, deciding to the point of, will these be targeted as, as investor units and filled with, with uh, you know, more than two people? Um, you, you can't tell who's going to buy them, but the marketing, you know, these are going to be 450 plus houses. Um, not many young, young professionals come out and can buy that house, first of all. Uh, other developments that we're doing and have done in South Baltimore, our target buyers, our families, um, young professionals, professionals in general, you know, all different age groups. Um, there was a downturn in the market where some of the houses were running out in some of the developments I've done. But as we speak, since the market's turned around and property values have come back up, they're either staying in those houses with uh, moving back into the city or selling those houses to new families. Uh, it's been an explosion in South Baltimore with a number of baby carriages, that, uh, including myself. So you see a lot of families that are staying in these houses and they provide two car parking. Like for instance, my house, one car only, leaves the house every day and that's me. And most of my work's done in South Baltimore, a lot of days I walk. So you're seeing a lot of, a lot of traffic that's, that's not actually not leaving the neighborhood, that's staying at home and using those parking spaces and not going out and using street parking. So, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think we want to uh, consider this issue of um, the substantial change and then we'll um, get into the um, substance of the, of the proposal <coughs> if there's an affirmative vote on that. Okay. Um, I'm going to deliver it for me. <coughs> yes. Like the president was more involved in 